This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. Here we go. Welcome back to another special episode of 21.5 Show. The show for professional pilots by professional pilots. Not always about professional yeah. pilots. Yeah. That's, <laughs> as we're learning, this is part two. If you haven't listened to part one of our interview with Roger Reeves, go back and listen to that first before diving into this. But uh, Max, part two is is a little bit different than the first part. Yeah, indeed. I think it uh, it changes gears a little bit. So let's quit horsing around and get right to it. What do you say? Let's do it. Thanks, of course, to our sponsors, Harvey Watt, the only place that pilots can get loss of medical insurance. And our friends at Advanced Air Crew Academy, aircrewacademy.com for all your online aviation training needs. And Certified Financial Planner for Professional Pilots around the world, Timothy P. Pope. All right, here we go. Part two. All right, Roger. So there was a time when you transitioned from being the line pilot of your operation to uh, being the the chief pilot, the chief pilot <laughs> <laughs> management management. Yeah. Into management. Uh, can you tell us kind of what spurred that decision and how you ended up uh, in that well, place? Well, I remember that rather clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming up with uh, 300 kilos in the back of that Aero Commander, a 690B, and I crossed over Yucatan. And I came came on up there towards the coast uh, where I was going to drop down for the old wells, and it was a beautiful night, and just after dark, and the moon was shining, and clouds was white and puffy down there, and I uh, turned on the ATIS, and everything's closed. Zero, 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 Tallahassee, Houston, <laughs> Dallas, <laughs> all the way up Memphis, everything's closed. Oh, 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 zero, zero. Now I'm not ready for this. <laughs> Still think, no instrument rating. <laughs> no instrument rating. It, I thought, you know, if I had a parachute, I'd get over one of these places and jump out. <laughs> but you didn't have a parachute. I didn't have a parachute in that door right there. It's pretty hard to get out of that air right. commander. So I, there wasn't nothing to do. I mean, fly around till you run out of gas and crash or right. try to come down a glide slope. Or so give it a shot, huh? I give it a shot. Let's see what I can do. I played with it a little bit. And uh, so I got out there and I kept, didn't say a word and, and came right down that glide slope and landed at New Orleans International Airport and bounced down that thing and kind of off to one side in the gravel. <laughs> Got it stopped and got out and kissed the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Once again. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I sat there all night long. And the next morning, I mean, I sat there. I mean, I was nervous. <laughs> that little police truck could have come down that runway. Nothing. Just ate us all night long. Zero, zero. Airports closed everywhere. So, uh, I don't know. It must have been 7, 8 o'clock. The sun's right out. And you can see right up through it. And it's bright, but you can't see a whole, a one light down there. I guess that's 200 feet, something mm-hmm. like that you could see. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow, wow. What in the world to do? And I, I had an hour and a half of fuel so I could go three or 400 miles. I said, I just, I just couldn't stand it any longer. So I cranked that thing up and took off. I'd done walk to the end. I was about halfway down the runway when I got stopped. I guess it's two miles long. Or something. Yeah, long mm-hmm. runway, sure. So I done walked down there to see where I was. So I took off and bam, time I took off, I was above it and into clear again. So it was only 30, 40 miles across Lake Pontchartrain to St. Timothy's Aviation, 3,000-foot strip there in the woods. Uh, I had that place from folks paid off. So I got over there, and I could see the runway down below it when I was directly above it, and it was spotted. And I circled and flew around as long as I thought I could, and I told Harvey, and we had a a walkie-talkie like the truckers use breaker so and so we're talking he said well it's, it's pretty clear down here and i said, I said well it looks like it but when i get in it ain't go, it's not going to be clear and so i come out where i thought it was and i just pulled the power and pointed it down and uh when i saw the ground i pulled back and i come to a stop and i thought all right i've got seven million dollars <laughs> 
and I ain't going to do that no more. <laughs> how, old, how old do you think you were at this point? I know exactly how old I was. I was uh, 38, I guess. Yes, 38 okay. years old. Uh-huh. So, so, that, so, that, so that's what finally scared you. Well, just enough I, to. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do that. Zero, zero like, approach. People shooting at you, uh, that prisons. Uh, no, that's it's DC zero, three yeah, headstand. It's, it's the foggy <laughs> approach. Yeah, that weather got me. Yeah, and it wow. kills a lot of people too. I, uh-huh. For sure. And them thunderstorms. I've I've had the wing nearly torn off, and I don't like that a bit. And yeah, thumb broke on the yoke and all kind of stuff upside down. <laughs> that that scares. Did you have too. an autopilot in that? Oh Air, yeah, Turing Commander. Yes, uh, oh good. Okay. Yeah. I bet that was. I bet that was nice. <laughs> 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 all, that, all that time flying, hand flying, eight hours oh, at a time. Yeah, it certainly was. Wow. But now I'll tell you what. Then uh, uh, carry that story on. So I told um, Lito, uh, Carlos A. Bustamante. I called him Lito, and he's the one that finally. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I always give him the the cocaine, and mm-hmm. he was the one who gave me the money. I just, okay. He's the only one I touched. Really nice young man there, and. Uh, We'd stand in the uh, in line there at the Cuban sandwich shop and right. tell a little stuff. So I just told him I'm not going to fly anymore. He told that's the last. That's the last. Oh no, Senor, for for more. Like they was making a good living with yeah, yeah, this right. stuff. They were probably making a thousand dollars a kilo, and here's three hundred thousand a week for them. So I, I felt rather sorry for him. Can you find anybody, anybody to fly? So that's when I hired Barry Seal. Well, let me ask you a question first. If you would have actually just stopped and said, sorry, Lito, can't help you, I'm done, and walked oh, away just, from the whole thing? Just like you and I. There's no, no reason. I was just a trucker with a company. Well, that's what I mean. But if no. you would have quit at that point, oh, yes, do you think was, you would have been free and clear? you think you ever would have had been gone to prison? Probably not, because I think that my trouble came. Um, um, I'll, I'll tell you about that. I... Uh, I have a hold a DC three load of out of Oaxaca, and that stuff was full of black seeds. I we had to shake the seeds out of it to be able to sell it. <laughs> a little shake at the time. It was the seediest stuff I've ever seen. I guess I had a couple of hundred pounds of seeds. So I had my friend back in Georgia, and I sent him seeds. Said plant us some pot somewhere. <laughs> so he hooked up with uh, some folks over around Ambrose, Georgia, some old moonshiners, and. Uh, they planted 245 acres in the corn. And then when it got with back, the corn, like in, in, in the corn, mixed in? there's a big round field with a, with a big irrigation system in the way in the woods. And they put a fence around it part of the way. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> so uh, that stuff grew. So, anyhow, they, they needed help to cut the males out and to keep it trimmed and cut the whole corn out because that, I mean, it's a huge field. 245 yeah. acres right. is big now. So I, uh, I got uh, seven. Indians, the Mexican fellas from down in Oaxaca. I went down there and got them and brought them back to the United States. They come across the border, and that was a it was the cutest thing. Those fellas had long hair and like they they dressed like the natives there. So I had to take them to men's shop, get them a haircut, <laughs> get them <laughs> put them up. on, put them on, Americanize them, Americanize. <laughs> Did they even know what was happening at this? Oh point? yeah, they okay. knew they was going to work in the marijuana okay. fields, and so I, I don't know what I paid them, but it was it was good, like a hundred dollars a day and. Wow. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying, but you can't leave this place. It was a nice house out there. Mm-hmm. So they stayed there, I, I guess, six months or so and kept that marijuana uh, in good shape. I mean, they was colas two feet long and the tops hanging out. I bought two hay balers to harvest it with. There was no way in the world ever pack that stuff up. So we just had to dry it in the field, leaning over, cut it down. And, uh, so my sister had married a fellow that was no good. Your uh, former co-pilot? No, he this uh, the sister. And no, no, uh, the uh, another one. Okay. And uh, <laughs> she married she, her husband was a wonderful fellow. He died, so she married this rascal. And uh, he, he, so we had sheet tobacco sheets all up and down that road in that field, and they were just piled with marijuana drying right in the sunshine. That's all we could do. So anyhow, this guy come around the field on Sunday. And went around the gate and went drove down the road and he saw that and he stopped and stole a sheet of it about 150 200 pounds put it on his motorcycle and he had his ex-wife with him because you could see her long footprint where it stood stuck in the mud <laughs> well the fellas that owned that land went crazy 
I mean, he just absolutely went berserk. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. I'm, I, 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 yeah, I'm yeah. Worth four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Get it out. And he had an old hammerless pistol in his hand. He's ready to shoot somebody. And I said, man, you got a billion dollar crop here, man. Yeah. I know who got it before dark. He's, he was bragging about it to my yeah. sister. And, uh, I said, I'll just take him and his ex-wife and take them to Mexico for a month or two. This thing gets done. They ain't going to talk. No, no, get it out of here. So I said, well, you're going to be a fool about it. So I took my, uh, I took my, um, Indians and I left and paid them, took them back to Mexico. <clears throat> Well, two or three days later, they calmed down. And they went to they went to Albany, Georgia, and they got about fifteen or twenty young black fellers. And you know how long that lasted. One of them had a hard time with the DEA trying to find a place. Jeez. <laughs> so anyway, they found it two hundred forty five towns, and I had three semi loads parked in my farm up at Plains, Georgia, next to Jimmy Carter, and oh, and the barn full up there. And what a mess. Paul Harvey kept that on for 10 years and the rest of the story. Yeah. He said, we're looking for the big rooster in California. <laughs> and that was you. You were <laughs> the big rooster, me. right? So anyway, <laughs> uh, they tried my friend and uh, two of them got five years and my friend got seven years. So I went to visit him in the pr prison. And uh, so when uh, while I was in there, Oh, he looked good. He was in, he, he, he was just absolutely been with a bush axe. And I mean, he, his hands was calloused and he had some man anyhow. And so the warden came through and he stopped and talked to us a little bit at the table. And I thought, he's all right. He's looking like an old farmer just got him a job. So I didn't say a thing to my friend. And so that night I went to see the warden and I brought a bottle of whiskey with me and he come on in, come on in. There's an old unpainted house there. And I think, in Georgia, there in Thomasville, and uh, we went on back in the back. We sat down and had a few, and and uh, I asked, "Is anything you could help for my friend?" He said, "Well, I reckon I could put him out there in charge of the dogs." I said, "You don't mean the bloodhound?" "Yeah," he said, "But he can't never get back around those men again. They'll kill him if he does." And now that that's the best job out here. He lives in a house trailer. He's got a um, a pickup truck with a dog cage on the back and go shop his groceries and I said you do that for my friend he said yeah I put him out there in the morning he said I got, got another fellow give me some trouble I got to put him in he said now they they have fun said one of them had to take them dogs and and uh, you give them a two two hour head start and they they have to agree ahead of time how many uh how many they can fences they can cross he calls them sons of bitches weigh 80 pounds a piece and you have to pick them up and put them over the fence <laughs> <everyone's> <laughs> saying, hey, they kill you if you jump back and forth so <laughs> And he said, they run down the middle of the highway. said, the scent don't uh, just come on your feet at all. said, it comes off of your whole body and permeates the ground. And said, those dogs can follow you easy for 24 hours. Wow. He said, there's no way. He said, they can pull a man uh, one-third faster than he can run. <laughs> so they, after two hours, you got to, they got to, you got to catch the other one. He said, they're in good shape. He said, they, mm -hmm. run, they run these conjures down when they, they're working on the road, and they, they run with their bush axe. So... Uh, <clears throat> My friend was had it good. His girlfriend could come out and stay in the trailer out there, and the warden come with his wife. And there was another convict there that was. I talked to him. He said he'd rather kill a man. Than he had a dog. <laughs> <laughs> he killed his daddy, and he killed a bunch of other ones, and all kinds of stuff. Little little squeaky person. I remember I gave him a hundred dollars for washing up the dishes and all for us. So uh, the warden and my friend, he had an airplane. They went down uh, to Destin, Florida, which is not real far from. South Georgia, on on the furlough. We go, you get a week's furlough before you get out. So many every a year, mm. and that little jerk wrote a letter. I read it. It's about five pages. Little I, little handwriting. He wrote it to the FBI about what Johnny and the warden were doing. So they uh, arrested him and put him in Atlanta under the pr prison incognito, and they took him before a little tobacco chewing judge there in Thomasville, Georgia, <clears throat> that. Uh, Give him 10 years for escape with a firearm. <clears throat> and I thought, <clears throat> wow, that's just terrible, just terrible. They, they, they didn't do anything wrong. You had a furlough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, what you want to, but they were just, uh, I guess because of they was having party in that trailer out there with their wives and girlfriend, they just punished them. That Judge Cato, 
He said, I hope you 10 years is the hottest sun, the coldest nights that you're busting up bricks out you to the very last day of it. Jeez. Wow. So I thought, well, that gentleman needs visiting. <laughs> so I made a fatal slip. <laughs> 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 I uh, I went to see the judge one Sunday morning. <laughs> At his house? At his house. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I had a talk with him. And uh, Monday morning, the next morning, he changed their sentence to 10 years probation. And he said, under the condition that neither one of you ever speak to Roger Reeves again. If you ever do, you're going to serve every day of this 10 years. Then I am comfortable that he's the one that went to the feds and they they indicted me for that marijuana charge. It's called a continuing criminal enterprise. It carries up to life without parole. Mm. And you have to manage three organizations with at least five people in each organization. So I said, I didn't do that. And my lawyer said, well, who serviced your airplane? Who put the gas in it? Who put the marijuana in there? Who took it out? Who, who drove it? Who sold it? Man, I can, I can think about 15 of them in your organization every time you hauled a load. He said, there ain't no way. It's all in how you count it. You, you're gone. <laughs> wow. And he said, the only way in the world for you to do is to plead guilty. So I gave up all the property I had and pled guilty to possession of 400 pounds of marijuana. And I got 35 years. Wow. And that had nothing to do with the cocaine you were smuggling. Nothing. Wow. So Barry kept on, and by that time I'd hired a guy named Jerry, and I had two airlines running, and it was just it was full out going. But that's how I that's how I August fourteenth, nineteen eighty two, I I come to a stop, and that's so, been. And then, so how many airplanes were running at that time for you? I had seven Panthers at that time, and it was Barry Seal, which, in case you been under a rock for the last 10 years barry seals the guy an american made that i'm sure every pilot listening to this has seen the movie <laughs> but <laughs> right. uh that didn't, didn't the things in the movie didn't seem like it went down exactly like they did in real life but that's i guess that's another story but that's hollywood for you. yeah that's yeah. hollywood but uh so so you had barry and and some other guys that were flying and then you got sent to prison jerry wills uh, you don't mind me saying his name he lives there in rolling hills estate yeah, wonderful man 80 years old he just spent his birthday up here with me last week <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking over old time. Yeah. So Jerry was doing more West Coast, right? Uh, uh, he was or, bringing he was bringing the cocaine to the West Coast, but I mm -hmm. think he was still coming in through the oil wells. Through the oil wells. Yeah, and he was landing okay. out there. Same. And then they were they all landing in Mena, Arkansas. No, Jerry knew nothing about Mena. Oh, that was just Barry's Barry. deal. Yeah, that was his contact with uh Okay. With. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Watch the movie. <laughs> maybe, or maybe, no, or maybe don't. Watch it what it should have been. Yeah, yeah. right. Mina. Exactly. So, so, and it wasn't just Barry flying, right? He had other guys flying with him, too, didn't he? Oh, he just had one guy named one Emil guy. Camp. All that okay. stuff in the movie was just made. Yeah, them flying in formation. And, yeah. yeah, that's And all. talking to the DEA. Well, you know what frequency they don't. They <laughs> yeah. split and go this way. It was it was somebody sitting in a rocking chair in New York and wondering, oh, I wonder how that How do we came. spice this up? Yeah. That's right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so you would get a payment from Jerry and Barry every month? No. They were working straight for me. Okay. I was I was in charge of all the money. And they was, uh, I, I believe that I was giving them $2,000 a kilo. I was getting five. Mm. And I, was, I had to contact the whole thing, and they were delivering it where they were supposed to be delivered. Got it. And so I would get the, uh, and old Barry, he was, uh, he was, I love Barry, but he was a belly acre. If you didn't pay him, where's my money? It's always a million dollars because he was up 500 kilos at the time, so it was $1 million a trip. And then I had to uh, put uh, 50000 for Mr. Big there in uh and mean mm. on top of it each time so he say i'm having dinner with the governor tonight wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh uh yeah i don't know what all he was doing out there but he had the cia there and uh, we know we i need know more about it now than i did then he just told me i cannot get caught in mean arkansas it's gonna cost you fifty thousand dollars every time i land well if you can't get caught there i can't get caught in nicaragua or columbia i guess we got a license to do it yeah, yeah so. the, from what I understand, we were talking about this uh, earlier. Is that Barry Seal somehow, you know, w was was working with and for the CIA at some point, and I think his running cocaine 
aligned with the CIA's interests at the time? I think that the CIA and, and him was hooked up. Yeah. And you're talking about bringing tons back. Well, and he's taking some guns down to the Contras. Maybe he takes some AR, AK-47s. I think that was just an excuse to bring the cocaine back. Now they know we running guns down to the to our our helpers in in uh, Honduras, mm-hmm. and they come back with a couple of tons of cocaine, and the CIA takes and does what they want to. You read the book, The Big White Lie. So I, I don't certainly the whole CIA wasn't involved in it, but there was some renegade. Yeah, I think my point was, and then when he was working with you, I think it, the CIA, it, everyone's interests were kind of parallel at that oh, point, absolutely. and then and then something happened as they do it with politics and whatever else and then all of a sudden it's like oh well now we got to bust everybody because we don't want to look bad well, it was <laughs> so then they went to bust everybody and then with barry's help and then and then they said okay well good job barry but now we need to bust everybody else so you got to snitch on everybody or we're going to throw, still throw you in prison and i think he just kind of got backed into a corner he um, was a little, little bit different than that. Uh, that. That's basically true. But what it was that he had he had given, and he, he told me that, he had given some pills to a DEA agent down in Providencia, an island there in the north of uh, Columbian Island. And he told him, I can get you millions of these things, man. What, what, what. Well, they held that over his head the whole time, and I knew that, it was, that he could go down for that. Oh. So now he's working with these people, and I don't know exactly how it dropped, but anyhow, that – uh, the guns to Oliver North, the, the mm-hmm. cocaine for money, all that came out. And I don't know just how it was. But anyway, he went and got 10 years for making the offer of conspiracy for those pills. But he got out on bail after he got to 10 years. And he took his jet. He had a Lear and he flew to Washington. He went in and knocked on the door of Edwin Meese, the Attorney General of the United States, and said, Mr. Meese, uh, we're bringing tons of cocaine out of South America. And... Me running my the office. So he went back the next day and said, listen, they're bringing tons out. I guarantee you I can help you. So they put a fellow with him, Jake Jacobson. I like Jake Jacobson. And uh, so they went down, got one and a half tons and all that, mm-hmm. put the, and then bellied it in at the runway there in Nicaragua and took all those pictures of Pablo Escobar and the generals yeah. and all that stuff. And now you can read the book Kings of Cocaine. They even mentioned me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, thank you. So, uh, uh, then Barry went to work for him. And, and uh, when Reagan heard that they had this information uh, on the Sandinistas, mm-hmm. he couldn't he couldn't contain himself. He just went right on national television. We have absolute proof that the Sandinista government is in the communist government, is in the cocaine running business. Well, that just blew the whole thing up. Yeah. Now, that's over. Now they're after Barry. Because now someone's got to pay. Well, Barry's <laughs> Barry's going to send all the whole Medellin cartel to prison and me. Yeah. So he comes. I like to tell this story. Uh, uh, after I saw that on the news, I, and I saw his plane bellied in there in the runway in Nicaragua. I thought, oh, God, Barry. I mean. Now you've done it. <laughs> you have done it. So the phone rang shortly thereafter. He said, Roger, I'm coming out. I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. So he said, I'll be out at 9 o'clock tonight. And he says, meet me at such and such a restaurant. I think it's a French restaurant here in Santa Barbara. And I went in just exactly at nine. There was a place full, maybe 30 people in there, leather skirts and jackets and blue jeans. Didn't look like the clientele. Didn't <laughs> yeah. look like the normal clientele, <laughs> huh? <laughs> something something was a little off, huh? Oh, they had a little bulge <laughs> in the yeah. chest yeah, and right. what nots. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I walked up to him and I said, <clears throat> are, you, are you wired, Barry? He said, no, I'm not. I said, well, you talk. I'm not going to say anything. So I pulled up a chair, and he leaned back, and he started telling me, and he just took a long time to tell it, told just exactly what happened, what the situation was, and he said, I've told Roger. I told it. You're the contact. That you're in it, but you are under my umbrella. You are completely free. You'll get a passport. You can keep your money. Go anywhere in the world you want to, but you've got to testify with me. <clears throat> so and the, and the he put his hands up over his eyes and the tears run down between his fingers. He said, "I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I'm facing three life sentences. I couldn't do it. They left me holding the bag. I was a scapegoat. So I've told everything." Whew. So they said, uh, "I said, we'll bring your head honcho over." And so he called Jake Jacobson, tall, lanky, 
crop duster and he came over and sat down there side of us. What a coincidence. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. So we got along fine, drink the same kind of whiskey. <laughs> he said, you can come tomorrow to Miami and uh, first class with Mari or, and testify in a federal grand jury. Or the only place you're ever going to see your family again, as long as you live, is in a federal penitentiary uh, maximum security visiting room. I said, come in first class, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you there. So I went down, and I, I went into a fella of ghouls. You've just committed to the flight there, at least at this point. Well, I, I, is I, what you're I, thinking, right? I, what, <laughs> yeah. What same. can I do? Yeah, yeah. right. You so buy yourself some time. This, Take I, the flight. I, walked down to, I went down to see this lawyer. I didn't realize that his partner had been blown out of his shoes and the office blown up for him representing a snitch. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and so he's on the treadmill, and I tell him my story. He said, well... I'll represent you for $600,000, but I don't talk to snitches. I said, well, I'm not a snitch. He said, well, that's what you're talking about. I said, no, man, I, 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 I've got to say something, but I mean, can... he said, listen, man, being a snitch is like being pregnant. You either are or you're not. <laughs> no in between, huh? There ain't nothing. He said, you tell them 99% and you leave something out that he said, they will convict you of everything you ever said and you're going to serve a life. Yeah, you, you got to tell everything you know. Now, hold on. This offer to snitch and be a witness, does this come with uh, witness protection? Yes. So relocation, new names. That's for everything. The whole thing. Money, and no problem at all. From what you knew at this point, could you successfully hide from the cartel via witness protection? Like, So if you did testify, do you think... Yes, they could, but if they want to, they can come kill my mother, my brother, my sisters, and okay. they want yeah, to. Well, that's, if yeah. they want to, mm-hmm. I don't know that they would, but that, that's a chance a person's taking. They let you know, hey, you're gonna you killing all of us, so yeah, we, we'll get you, and we'll make you pay, right? So they could certainly do that and put a tire around them and give them a necktie, you know, about that. The old so, Columbia yeah, necktie, yes, yeah. so it's vicious. So I, uh, it wasn't that I was scared of them. I just didn't want to tell, I just didn't want to be a snitch. It was just like, how can I work with somebody? Sit down and eat with them, go and do these things, and then put them in prison for life? I just couldn't do it. It's make you sick to your stomach to think about it. So I went to another lawyer and he told me about he was much nicer and he told me about the same thing. So I went to the courthouse. I was supposed to meet him like at three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh uh here they come. They're three big cars men in there with a machine gun, pistols in the front, and Barry in the back with two big fellows on each side of him. He's big. He jammed in that cart. <clears throat> and there was a, a marble pillar there at the federal courthouse in Miami. It's huge, big as, half as big as a room. And I was standing there side of that thing, and they all looking the other way. And I just stepped down one step, and the windows was all open. I hit the top of that car like that. <laughs> <laughs> they come around with that machine gun. <laughs> they almost tore those cars up. <laughs> I said, see how easy it would be? They didn't think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told him, listen, I'm having trouble with a lawyer and Barry. Here, here's here's mine. Come you see him. So I uh I um I took his card for his lawyer and then uh Mari and I went to a festival restaurant that night and Carl Gates. Wait, so what are you thinking at this point? Are you just trying to buy yourself some more time? Yes. Just kind of kick the can? That's all I can do. Okay. I'm, I'm right. gone. I'm leaving. But you're figuring, you're trying to figure out your way to way out to escape. Oh, I got to go. I ain't, okay. I'm not going all to right. I'm not going to testify. Right. Okay. So, so your mind's made up. It always was, I reckon. Yeah. I just you're just kind of. Is there any way. You're trying anything. to buy yourself time to come up with a plan to. Yeah. Well, I was I was thinking maybe I could say something. I don't know. You don't have oh, to yeah. tell everything. Weasley, sure. And, uh, yes, I was a pop. That was, that was that. becoming very apparent. That wasn't how that it worked. Wasn't huh? going right quick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I went to a festival restaurant and uh, Barry knew I, I liked that restaurant. It was Michelin 3. I think it's closed now. Oh, what a wonderful restaurant. So Mari and I was there. And uh, so Barry and De- Debbie come in about the time we was finishing our meal. And we fooled around there and talked and had dessert together. And I just said, Barry, they're going to kill you, friend. Oh, no. They're, just, they're in prison. They've done that. And your chore brother, and he's done that. I said, Barry, they're going to kill you. And I hugged his neck. I might have kissed him. I just like, I love Barry. I mean, he was my friend, an ace pilot. And just, just we my friend. And we, we just... We'd shared a secret for a long time. I mean, what we were doing was mm-hmm. big. I mean, some. So anyway, I left and I took my family and we fled to Brazil. And we was down there about six months. And uh, I got word that Barry was 
had been assassinated there, there in the, he, the judge gave him six months in a halfway house and the DEA was begging him not to do it. So they'll kill him. He said, we should have thought about that before we did this. So he gave him six months. He gave him a death sentence. So it wasn't long before he's going in every night at six o'clock. And Ronaldo, the guy that flew up on the first load with the Mac 10 in the back seat. To keep an eye on you. Kill me. And right. That was funny. I'll tell you a little bit about that. We took off at a banana plantation and it was muddy. I mean, it was mud and raining. And my wheel wheels on that aero commander filled up with mud. And the wheels wouldn't come up. Well, I'm not going 2,500 miles with the wheels down. <laughs> <laughs> Did you try and retract the gear? Or over you just knew? Over. Well, no. Oh, and it just wouldn't, you just wouldn't couldn't get up. the lights out and so you, you knew what was going on? Full of mud. I mean, that airplane's pretty low to the ground. Did yes, that, it that, is. That, and that and airplane do all right on all that those dirt strips you were laying on, jungle strips? Yeah, well, yeah, it was all right. Was the belly all tore up on it? No, no, I never... I drug the tail a time or two and had to have a patch. <laughs> Coming in really slow, you know? Yeah. Uh, All right. So you got Ronaldo, a load of cocaine, and cocaine can't and get so, the gear up. And I'm, I can't get the gear up. And so he says, I told him, I said, we've got to land at Louisiana. I know a place up there. No, no. And he put the gun right to my head. No, no. I Louisiana? Excuse, no, excuse me. In, in Belize. Oh, okay. In, I was in, like, that's a long, long way. <laughs> I had to land down. in Louisiana. That's where I was going. Yeah, that's where that's but, the destination. Uh, I had to sure. land. And so I went to let the Car Carter Ranch there. It had a 5,000 foot runway, I reckon, on it. Caliche. So I just said, well, shoot me, fool. You're going to die too. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Louisiana, no. And I mean, he was, he was crazy, man. He was just stupid, ugly, ugly fella. He, he, so anyway, uh, we landed there. And I remember we went in, Mr. Carver. Uh, we had lunch there while the boy washed the airplane, cleaned the wheel wells out, and we got some fuel and took on off and went on up there. <laughs> and he, he's the guy that, that killed Barry. Mm. He was two other ones. He's doing life there in Angola. Hmm. Yeah, it's too bad the way that turned out. Yeah, it is. Whew. So that's how I I, uh, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was kind of the end of of the airplane smuggling days. Yes, that uh, I was I was arrested in not well. I guess a year or so after that, Barry worked for me a little over a year. Uh, it wasn't two years. And uh, uh, he hauled about 30 loads at 500 kilos a load. And, and my friend Jerry hauled 30 loads. And I'd done my six or seven or whatever it was. So we we, uh, we, uh, we racked up some some weight. Yeah, no kid. So so back to the festival restaurant, you told Barry, look, they're going to kill you. Yeah. And then we're, and then after that, that, that was when you, you is that when you hit the road? Yeah, we we left. Yes, I went went back out to California and uh, we we. But uh, you were in hiding at this point because now they're no, they wouldn't they wouldn't arrest me. I was like, okay, I got to get a lawyer and get down here. So I, oh, okay. And then we got on a boat and chartered out of uh, anyhow the Caribbean, chartered it to uh, to Brazil. Oh, and that's and that's where you were gonna. And I was I was gonna. Then you're on the run. I was gonna live there and got Brazilian passports. And my wife just after she just cried. I was gonna buy a place out there to grow soybeans. She said, "If I die in this godforsaken country, please don't leave my bones here." <laughs> and I said, Honey, "If you feel that bad about it, let's get out of here." And that was a bad mistake I made. And we went back to Europe and met Howard Marks and got into business again. And Howard told on me, and I went to prison for many years. Let's take a minute to recognize our sponsors that help us to make this interview possible. We'd like to recognize Advanced Air Crew Academy. You can see all of the offerings that Advanced Air Crew Academy has on their website, aircrewacademy.com. Training modules for your flight department. If you're a professional pilot, especially in Part 135, you know about that online training requirement you got to do every year. Advanced Air Crew Academy makes it painless. And beyond the 135 requirements, they have awesome training courses for any part 91 operator aircrewacademy.com thank you advanced aircrew academy and of course our friends at harvey watt insurance the largest provider of loss of medical insurance for professional pilots with over seventy thousand pilots insured see all their offerings at harveywatt.com the flying and, and running of drugs was is one thing but the the whole prison story wow. of your life is believe so how, so how many when did you get out of prison right now this is uh november of 2022 i got out in april of, of 20 
April of 20. Okay. No, wait, right when the world ended. <laughs> yeah, that's right. perfect. So, and and total, how many years have you been, spent in prison? 33 full years. 33 full years. And in how many countries have you been in prison? Seven countries and 28 jails in prison. I'm counting about three different jails. But I, if you stayed there for some time, I was in prison. So I. So like I, the I story we talked about in the Mexican, that was a jail where they tortured you, not a prison. It was in a prison, yes. That was a prison? But uh, the first prison, the first one was in Mexico over on Cedros Island. I uh, I sailed in there with my yacht after I was getting away from the big rooster in California, that 200 Oh, yeah. Ton. And we sailed in there in part. Mari and had the two little girls. And we been at sea for a while, and I'd done – broke the motor on that brand new boat. <laughs> it wouldn't work. Sailed into Cedros Island. They wasn't a cedar tree within a hundred miles of there. So, uh, Cedros is cedar. Uh, anyway, a dusty, dirty place. And we went to a little restaurant and open side and, uh, little tin chairs and the table and a big old fat guy owned the place and he's jolly. And he, we had huevos ranchero and some coffee and <laughs> little thing. And we happy to be off the boat after a week at sea. And the two guys come and get up there by the place, and Mari's a pretty gal. And says, one guy just got a pair of shoes under his arm. You can see them and wrapped up like that. And he keeps staring at her. And I was like, give him the old nod, like, uh huh. So he still comes over, stomps over the table. And he was how we got there. I'm like, any one of your damn business, man. Why we got here? You know? Mari said, on a yacht, a yacht. He said, oh, me. Heffy to immigration. I'm the chief of immigration. Uh, Papers. And he was rude. <laughs> and I says, uh, Senor, we having breakfast. Go away. And after breakfast, I'll go get the papers. We cleared in Ensenada. Pente minutos. 20 minutes. And he stands right over her looking down. And I ease my chair back. I said, excuse me, Mari. Come out here. And I talked something about his mother, and it was about hit him upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> and I knocked him out. <laughs> and whatever, one leg just wham. And uh, so uh, when he got up, his pants was all wet, and he went running sideways down the street. <laughs> Jeez. And Mari said, You've done it now. <laughs> yeah. <I'm- laughs> yeah. So they, uh, uh, I went, I, what nothing happened for several hours. And, uh, so uh, I was out on the boat, and I think it was an afternoon nap or something, and a little boy came out in a, a little kayak or something other and said, uh, Commandante wants to see you. So I got half-dressed in blue jeans or blade in the soup or something, got in with him and went ashore, and there's two Federal Marines. Mm. With their bayonets and their guns, so they took me with a gut that jerk, and he took me out to the edge of town. It must have been a... Uh, uh, the city hall. It was something not much or nothing. And it was built in the side of a red clay hill. And they took me back in the back and put me in a, in a room that was a jail. It was nothing. It was just concrete walls, concrete floor, and, and bars on the window and, and a door with the bars. You know, looking out on the outside. Whew. So by this time, Mari's heard about that I'm locked up. <laughs> okay. And she bought, <laughs> she bought me some Tater chips and Coca Colas and candy or something other, you know, to live on. To, she go had to go to another island to get a lawyer to try to get me out. So uh, <clears throat> while I'm there, I, uh, some two children, a boy and a girl, I think about ten years old, and they came up, and the the window was almost to the dirt where the side of the red hill came up, and it was dug into the back, and they were there, and they had infantigo, that sores that children used to have on their face. I never yeah. see it anymore, but they would just eat up with it. Oh, I felt sorry for them little poor children, like on a garbage heap. And I'm giving them Coca Colas and candy through the bars, and I'm saying, and I done reached up the lock to that door, was below halfway, about a third of the way up, and I got up, and put my feet on the wall, and pulled, and you could pull the the top of that mm. frame out just a tiny bit yeah. with all my might. So I got a little flat piece, and when I pulled it, I got it in there, and then I got and order to rock, and I beat that down. And then I got bigger pieces, and I got it, and I beat it, and I beat it, my hand was bloody. That sucker. <laughs> and I pulled it down so I could get out. Jeez. And I just kicked the front door plumb off of that place when I walked out, and I got me a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you made it big enough where you could spit through the bars. Right, no, uh, 
where the where the window at the top. Oh, at the top, fit. right. Mm. I pull this out. Oh, I got see. Bent I down you. enough. I kept bending rocks all the way down to the lock. By that time, I, I see. So you peeled it away from the corner, right, right, and then you could slip out, out, out there. there. It wasn't. It wasn't nothing big deal. But it, you normally wouldn't have got out of there. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's giving you a old kind of size rock. She won't. They just loved it. <laughs> wow. So I got out of there and uh, I went and. Uh, uh, the, a man on the other boat said, listen, I'll, I'll bring your wife down to Bahia to Tortuga tomorrow. You better get out of here. <laughs> so I took off and went down there with the children. And when I got got there, I got arrested. <clears throat> I had to, all over Mexico, arrest the captain of the Jolly Swagman, arrest the bandito captain of the Jolly Swagman <laughs> the bandit. for assault, insult, and jailbreak. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to fly to the capital with him. I stayed there about a week. But the biggest thing is my little daughter Miriam, which I met, she came there with her hair all in the French braids and a little dress on with pleats. And she had my thirty eight pistol in the fold of her dress. And she walked sideways between the bars and gave me the gun and said, shoot him, Dad. Jeez. <laughs> Get that gun out of here. <laughs> I said, no, they're my friend. They were taking me out to dinner at the restaurant, all kinds of stuff. It wasn't no big deal. They had oh, my boat my passport. I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, where are you going to go, right? Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> I thought, you got to little girl. You know? Yeah, no kidding. Thanks, but no thanks, Marion. So that was my first jailbreak. <laughs> and and not your last. Not my last. <laughs> I had, uh, yes, uh, five different times I got out of there. And some of those was. Uh, you paid a heavy price. Very tenuous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I still got a dead spot in my back that gets hot where I jumped out the courtroom in Spain from 31 feet. <laughs> and got away. Spider-Man escapes, they said. Where do you even start with that stuff? I, I know. It's just, <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So you so so after that, you got convicted and sent to a Mexican prison. No, I, I paid seven hundred dollars and apologized. I just told. And that was it. I think I recited a poet poem or something other. <laughs> <laughs> Made friends, wrote a check, and got out. Huh? Uh, cold cash. Yeah. yeah. No, it was just oh, yeah. jail. It wasn't nothing. Right. Was a, hitting an immigration officer, and I and well, when I was in there, they said that, that guy was a son of somebody that was an important politician in Mexico yeah. City, and they had sent him all the way to the furthest outpost so he could do the least damage. And of course, he did it there too. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> cared. <laughs> <clears throat> so that was my first. Uh, it wasn't my first jail, but it was uh, the, the the first one of any consequence. Yeah. So so then you got back on the boat and continued to Brazil. No, no, no. We 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 lived in Mexico for a year, and then we went on through the Panama Canal. We stayed a year in Cabo San Lucas. There wasn't even a road there at that time. But just and it was a dirt street, and they had like one pizzeria and open air discotheque. You kept us awake. <laughs> that would have been like nineteen eighties. No, uh, like nineteen seventy. Seven or so, wow. so, something like that. Yes. Well, Cabo hasn't changed. I don't know if you've been there. <laughs> oh, it's still the same. I it's don't still even want to go. <laughs> I hear they got a paved runway, all Yo. kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, couple big of them. Big, and, big and, and, runways. Yeah, and immigration, all that. Yeah. Yeah. And you they can't punch nothing. those immigration officers. Yeah, that's one. We, we do not re- official recommendation of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you end up in a Spanish prison? I met uh, my fine gentleman, Howard Marks, called mm-hmm. Mr. Nice, his book, Mr. Nice. <clears throat> and we uh, we hauled hashish out of Pakistan and we hauled some big loads out of Thailand, 20-ton loads of marijuana and a t- 10-ton load of hash. And uh, the heat was getting on him. And uh, he was going to give me $2, $2 million to haul, haul a load out of uh, – out of Morocco to England. And this is now in boats, ships. Yeah. I, yeah. Airplanes over now. They got that over the horizon radar. You can't get off the ground without them seeing you. So it was, it's all through. Mm-hmm. So you get, get the boats now and you have to be r- far out of the way places even with that. So I was um, hired a German citizen. There was a boat for sale there in, in Amsterdam. And uh, he's a jolly fella. And uh so during the negotiations to buy the boat, I asked him what he liked to hold hashish. Well, what do you pay? I said, I'll give you $400,000 a trip. Hell yeah. I want to buy <laughs> so he did the load and uh, unloaded it. And uh, I gave him the $400,000 and he bought him a shiny new car and a long cigar. And I guess was the police was watching him. But anyway, 
he told. They, they, they arrested him, and he said, hey, if you'll tell us who gave you this money, we'll let you. You'll be home by Christmas. But they didn't tell him which Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he, could, he admitted hauling three and a half tons of hashish and told on me. Now, I don't know where it first came from or not, but Howard was the one to pay me the $2 million. And Howard never would pay me. So he gave me a passport to go to, to, uh, to England to get the money. And when I got off the plane, I got up to the Dutchman, big, tall fellow, six foot six. And when he looked at that passport, he just looked up quick and he says, is this your passport, sir? I said, yes, sir. And he came around and that big hand folded all the way around my arm. <laughs> he says, come with me. <laughs> so we went into a, like a jail place and there were several people there with turbans on, five or six immigration guys with the computers. And he put, he took mine and put put it behind a little clip on his computer. And when he did, I hit that door and run through that crowd, knocking people going here, yonder, and everywhere. There was a window in one place I got in, went through another one, and I was in a long corridor. Oh, like you know, where you like in the airport back in you know, in yeah, the airport now, right? Right. I'm in the airport, yes. So uh I I, I just flew into Amsterdam to right. go get mm -hmm. my money. And I was supposed to meet the guy there. So anyway, I um I was in a corridor where you go down to the plane where all those people walk. There was nobody there. And at the end of it was a, probably a 10-foot wide, wide stainless steel elevator door. And it said forbidden or whatever. And I punched the button. It opens. I went down one floor. Nobody there. And there's a KLM captain's jacket and a hat. A little bit too big for me, but I put them on real quick over my <laughs> 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 And uh, I walk out, and uh, there's a crew. Going, there's M M747 just lined up that KLM stuff around there. I mean, I've never been to such a place, but any our crew, about 20 of them walking out. And I thought, I'll follow them. So I got right behind them and I'm walking along. <laughs> In your uniform. Captain. <laughs> so they got to the gate way up there, a couple of blocks. And they were showing their pass to a couple of guys there that was guards on the gate. I, Whoops, that won't do. So I turned around, and when I got back to the corner of the building, I said, I can't go there. Good Lord. And there was a fence, I guess about a 10-foot chain-link fence with a wire barbed wire on the top of it. Well, I just climbed up that and did a pull up on that barbed wire. And my, with my hand, I said, all right, I missed, missed the barbed wire. And got over the light in good shape. And then I had to jump down into the shrubbery. And I jumped down that shrubbery, and I mean, it was like the end of the line. That stuff was like the crown of thorns. <laughs> it had thorns on it that long that was just tore me up. Oh, uh, I mean, I was cut from that stuff where I was jumped in it. And it was about that high. And I took that jacket off and went to kicking it into those thorns so I could go. I didn't have but about six or eight feet to go, but it was, you couldn't go. They, they put that there for a reason. Yeah. And a, a, a van came up and two young policemen got out with their guns in the air. Halt, halt. That just made me go faster. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I finally broke through that stuff, I mean, and went across the road, and there was four policemen standing there chatting with each other, but their radios didn't work between the airport and the and Oh, because the airport police, police and the city yeah. police. <laughs> so I went right by those policemen. <clears throat> I remember one woman, I remember the French braid and the, the cross she had hanging in her cleavage. I, you can just see things like this, you know. It, and I went back into the airport and uh, – where all the people were waiting. There must have been hundreds of them waiting for their loved ones to get off those airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I got in that crowd, and I went down an escalator. Uh, it said Nardy Trains, and one was to Amsterdam, and the other one was to uh, uh, Rotterdam. And I went on the one to Rotterdam. There's nobody in it. There was, was waiting on them bullet-like trains. And I went in the bathroom, shut that door, and it went, shh. And I thought, my sentiments exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> what a mess. So I went to the airport and nobody showed up. So he had he had he had betrayed me and gave me that passport to go get uh, mm. go get the money and uh, every Such time I, I and then he he cried and begged Mari, but Mari, I didn't do it. I didn't tell Roger to come and I went and there's a police when I leave him, they're there again. I knock one of them over and they run in through the crowd with their guns and I get away again. Jesus. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure he was turning me in. Where's that guy now? He did. He is. Wouldn't you imagine? Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> I guess it caught up with him, huh? No, wow. I didn't kill him. He, he died of cancer. Yeah. Wow. Poor fellow. He just couldn't. So you, so you never got paid for that, but then how did you, where did you get arrested? Where's the next time you spent in prison? Oh, they they arrested me in Spain. Finally, I come back to see to to see Mari. I was went. Down she was to, living there at the time. Mari was living in Mallorca. We lived over there for a good number of years, and uh, so they they arrested me. I went to my son's little party in his first grade or something, and they just come with their guns and machine guns all over me and put me in in jail there in Palma for double extradition to the United States and to Germany. So I was facing, I didn't know how much time in Germany for three and a half tons of hashish. I didn't, I didn't do anything in Germany. I'd never been to Germany. I didn't think about Germany. But I had used a German citizen in an international crime, mm. and you pay the same price as if you did it there. Because in England, they had to catch. They had to have some evidence. In Germany, they didn't. They just had to have his word. Uh-huh. So uh, I went up there, and um, they put me incognito, like under a jail almost, a long thing with a huge bathroom with cloth, a bathtub with clothes. And that was the only good thing about it. The whole underneath the basement of the jail was mine. And then they brought my food down there. And I think I stayed there four or five months before I went to went to court. And if I would have known it, all I had to do was say, no, it wasn't hashish. It was camel shit and honey. They just fooled us all. Because then it would have been conspiracy. And all I could have got was three years. Oh, but uh, oh, because they had never actually they didn't have the that. evidence. Nobody had that. seen anything, so that was just the word of the guy. Camel shit, and honey. So I, but that's the reason they didn't let me talk to nobody. And uh, my wife went up to talk to somebody. And she got the best lawyer in town, the judge's wife, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Frau Holmberg, and she was so sweet. Tell exactly, no, no, you cannot lie to the court. <laughs> oh my gosh! So I told it. I got. Uh, I got. Uh, eight or not eight years, I believe, sentence. And after one, oh, but let me tell you, when they caught me in in Mallorca, they took me for the, uh, uh, and, and I'd got already got away from the police three times over there, you know. But uh, so I uh, had a courtroom, and they had four policemen on me. They took me to court with my hands ha- uh, handcuffed behind me like this. Oh, one up over your back and <laughs> one, one down low. Me. Yeah, wow. that's where I ever where I, I went. But in the courtroom, they had to put put them in front of me like this. So I had this lawyer and I says, uh, how high are we? He said, you'll kill yourself. I said, I'm dead anyway. <laughs> I'm going to give it a whirl if two of these guys go to smoke or something. And so the four of them were standing right behind me. The courtroom was packed. There was a, a stenographer over there filing her nails and she was very pregnant. <laughs> and uh, two of them left and uh, there was a a desk in front of her, like a piano flat. And I bounded across that courtroom back like, fast as I could go. And there was a big window there and I kicked it out. <laughs> and I looked down, I thought there might be a power line or something I could get on the way down or a palm tree or something. There was nothing, but there was like a station wagon parked up on the sidewalk in that little medieval street. And, uh, when I worked on the fire department, we practiced jumping in the net. So I knew how to jump, but I, I jumped and I hit the top of that car dead center, and the roof went to the drive shaft. <laughs> you said in your book it was 31 feet? 31 feet from the bottom of the window to the top of that car is what the newspaper said. <laughs> so in the windshield, I saw it going over three or four cars, and it looked like it was it looked like it was snow going up as the window shadowing <laughs> as I was being half unconscious. I knew I felt like Donald Duck getting out of that thing, taking off. <laughs> So anyway, they caught me down the road, and uh, one policeman hit me in the back with a shotgun, knocked me down. I don't know. I got a dead spot from nerve damage back there, just the size of about a quarter. And uh, if I get, I get hot sitting somewhere, that thing starts to itch. Really? Yeah. So that's Jeez. a memory of that day. Right. So anyhow, the newspaper come out, Spider-Man escapes. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of, my, one of my escapes. Wow. So ultimately... You did get sent to prison yes. in Spain. No, I, 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 they kept me there 17 months while mm-hmm. I fought extradition to Germany. Then they give me double extradition, first to Germany and then to the United States. So your first stop was Germany, so and you Germany. had to do how much time there? Uh, eight years. Okay, so, so tell us how that went. Well, it wasn't so bad uh, because I found out um, 
after I after I jumped out that window and they caught me, they beat me up pretty bad. And uh, one guy hit me with a ring, and I don't know where he came on, on my chin or something. Chin, yes, and cut pretty deep, and my shirt just got covered in blood. And uh, uh, I was a I tell you about acting like a hero one time, but it's it's not. You've heard of women picking up cars off of children and stuff like that, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I had right. one of those experiences. They had me in that cell, and they were thumping on me. And I, okay, I, I handcuffed. I ain't going in front of me. I, I ain't going to fight four policemen. They, we the best in the world, and they popped me a few times. And so it, I looked pretty bad. I, I wasn't hurt. I, I cut and a lot of... Yeah, but a lot and, of blood all over your shirt. Right, you look pretty I, rough, I, huh? I look, look, look like you've been roughed up pretty okay. good. So one of them come up behind me and hit me on my ears like that. And I mean, oh. it electrified me. I don't know what happened, but I could throw those guys upside the wall like they were rag dolls. I was screaming out kicking I, they they was jamming the door trying to get out <laughs> after it, it popped in the ears you just went just, nuts huh well yeah i, I lost it. i mean you I, i've had that before also when i was on the fire department people uh, dying and stuff and you couldn't hold them down two or three of them would throw you up in the air on their yeah. arm so i i think i had something of that wow uh, so anyway i look bad <laughs> so then the next day the um uh Somebody from the ambassador for England, uh, from Germany, came to see me, the Count's Consul, and I wouldn't change clothes. I ain't changing clothes. I'm doing right now. So he came to see me and saw how bad I looked. So when I got to Germany, I got three jail days for every day that I was in Spain because of the horrid conditions. And it was 10 times better than Germany. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty, pretty good once I got out to fight and I got sent to Madrid. It was all right. It really was nice. And the uh, food was delicious and it treated me so good there. Uh, so I don't have anything. It was a hard jail. I mean, mm-hmm. one of them, a terrible place, but I, I, it was all right. As far as prisons go. Wasn't I mean, it was, it was, and, it was, and Roger has a good, he, his opinion of prisons is you can take with a, a lot of confidence because he's been in many different ones. So he, he's 28 of them. Yeah, yeah. You should go on Yelp and then write reviews for all these prisons you've been into. Just so how many that, stars? Uh, potential criminals would know. Right. Yeah, so out of five stars, what would you give the Madrid prison? Probably about four. Okay. There you go. All right. it's it's all right. Right. Listen, I mean, they had the best food you could imagine. They had paella, and and they cooked um, you paella, paella, and and the, the shellfish seafood poking out oh, of it. Come and, on! Oh, and it was just you weren't going to get no better in the restaurant. <laughs> they had a they had a bakery there, and some and every week they would change the the loaves. You got a loaf every day, and sometimes it would be so airy light. And then on Saturday morning they would come with big tubs of hot chocolate and pour it to you at your room. Man, I would just go berserk on it, eating that that bread dipped in that hot chocolate. It was so good. <laughs> So and and then you could order three kilos of food every week from the grocery store. That's seven pounds, and we had uh, prison money. And there was five or six of us in there. It was millionaires. There's several other p- fellows in there, and there was maybe fifty guys. And we would all give them money. And we had a table out there in the in the patio. It was nothing but like a tennis court, and uh, I mean it was salmon. And it was just anything you could think of. We just piled up out there to eat. <laughs> and uh yeah and, and uh wow there were some bad fellas in there there was a red brigade out of, out of italy and was in there and the bass terrorists one morning i was just blown out of my bed nearly boom the the terrorists had put a, a bomb in a car and left it parked side the road and two guards went there there was nothing they was vaporized nothing but their shoes left so it, it was it was a bad place but we treated each other good it was, and you ate good huh? yeah and so we ate good and uh and uh, it, it, it was all right and uh, uh, yeah, police was like they're rough everywhere. They took me to the airport and left me uh, when I was going to go to Germany, and uh, they left me handcuffed all that way. I think about eighteen hours from. Oh my like god, this. that was miserable. And they put me, it was like a, a tomb inside of a hangar. It was like one of those above ground tombs, and uh, I, I was in bad shape by the time the, oh, the Germans with the came. circulation and your yeah. arms no, it, yeah. it was horrible i mean it was it, i was hurting and the germans like what in the world all that hardware all over me two leg irons <laughs> handcuffs like that and they took it off i hard to get my arms down they come out a big military plane flew me to germany a military plane yeah wow what okay so you get to germany and uh uh 
land there and they, they take me, I spend the night in Hamburg in a, in a jail. Uh, and then they take me up to uh, northern part of Pese Hosting, anyhow. Uh, I, I forget what it was, but it was a minimum, medium security prison. And there was a bunch of snitches there. I didn't know it. And they was holding me because they didn't want me to go and meet up with anybody down uh, like the the captain of the boat that was down in uh, Lubeck. <clears throat> so uh, I looked around. They had a yard there, and they, they had a couple of guards up watching me. I, I had to go out by myself. And uh, so we went to the shower, I guess, about three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you went down naked with your towel and your soap. That was it. And you got under there, and they locked the gas. And it was pretty close. Everybody standing there buck naked, and they turned the water on for about five minutes. All right, water coming off. And you'd be red, pink, and go back up. And you had a long walkway to go in. And the top of it was like an atrium with, with glass and a lot of framework up there. And I'd done seen that fence wasn't very high out there. <laughs> so it was snow all over everything. And I... Uh, it was waiting in the middle, and I jumped up and climbed up through that glass. And there was a guy named Frank that was next door to me, Big Smith. He was just screaming, escape, escape, escape. Oh, oh. And, and so they caught me, and then they, they took me that immediately to Lubeck Prison and put me there in the basement of that maximum security prison. And uh, so I went to court, and I got eight years, but for the 17 months I was in Spain, they gave me three days. So that was 50, what's it, 17, 51 months credit. So you only have to do two thirds of your sentence in Germany. So I was almost through. Mm. So I don't know what two thirds of eight is right now. Yeah. Six. So I had to do about another year. So uh, at the end of the year, they was extradited me back to the United States. So I escaped from that maximum security prison in Germany, and, and I don't know if anybody else got out of there. I maybe had, but uh, well, how how many years when you got extradited? Wh- wh- how many years were you going to have to do in the U.S.? I had about twenty five years of parole, okay. and they would could have made me do all of it. A parole? Parole. I got 35 years. I got 30 years of parole and five-year sentence on that for that marijuana. So if you would have been extradited, you did the rest of your time in Germany, not escaped, and came to the U.S., you, you would have just been on parole? No, they was going to put me in prison because of the Barry Seal. Oh, 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 oh okay. I, All right, so I'm, you had 30 years of parole plus so another I did, charge waiting I, for I, you. After I got out of the German prison one year later, I did come to the United States, and they, they caught me here, and they made me do 11 years for a parole violation. That's the longest in the world history anybody ever heard of. <clears throat> Nobody heard of 11 years for parole violation. <laughs> they gave me two years for the uh, escape in Spain when I jumped out the window. They gave me two years for the escape in Holland. They gave me two years for the escape in uh, uh, Germany. They gave me two years for cutting a hole in the Metropolitan Detention Center and going down to the basement. I could, couldn't get out the fire door. And then, I don't know, they gave me t- some time for the hashish in Germany. It added up to 11 years. And I took them to court. And I said, it's not illegal to escape from those countries. You can't put that six years on me. And the prosecutor says, I can't defend against that. I give them the ca- case of Dane. Uh, so anyway, uh, the pro board wrote me a letter, said, if you will drop your case against you, we'll take that off and give you a new hearing and you can expect a more favorable result. Well, they were lying. They come back and said, ah, you think you like one of them Vietnam veterans to call out them bamboo cages like when you want to. Well, we don't think that of you. <clears throat> we think you're a lot bigger risk than we had originally accessed. So we're going to take you above your guideline six years and give you 132 months. How do you like that? I said, I hope you burn in hell. Well, we can talk about that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Elf. Well, so tell us the story how you escaped from the German prison. All right. I knew I was leaving pretty soon <laughs> to, to the United States. And uh, so I, I had a lawyer there, uh, uh, like a constitutional lawyer, one of these that could work it out for trying. To, and he said, you're going. But he was a sporty fellow with a, black, a leather jacket with patina on it and all. And uh, he, even though he was he was a professor, he looked like about 40 years old. And uh, so I, I was, uh, I don't know what, I went out to the prison for some reason. And I came back in the rain and I saw above the sally port and above the guard tower at the, at the sally port, that sally port's where your entrance to a prison, is uh, all the, a room full of razor wire had been removed. And it was bare up there. 
And I thought, wow, they were building another fence to join up to make the prison bigger. Mm. And the, a great trench had been dug, oh, oh, I don't know how far, but a long, long ways. And it looked like it was about six foot deep. And the, the, the pilings were already in place. And the big 30-foot sheets of uh, concrete were lay, waiting to be put up. But it was raining, so they couldn't work. So I got in there, and I had a job uh, cleaning the lawyer's office in the evening. So in the lawyer's office was on the bars, were not like on our cell bars. They were more ornamental. And we could, we, we get out of that office, you're still in the prison yard. You ain't gone nowhere. So, but you was in a, a compound where they kept the um, uh, golds and all for the soccer players. So that you couldn't put it up on the wall. They had a they had guard towers ever ever not not hundred feet. I guess I guess with machine guns in there and rifles. I mean, it, they, you could hear them practicing shooting shoot you. It was definitely those guys were trained. So, but I saw maybe a way. So I called the lawyer and told him to come see me. And I said, listen, uh, Thomas, I can get out of here. He said, boo, you can't get out of here. Nobody's ever got out of this place. I said, I can get out of here. He said, well, that's mighty strong of you to say. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $10,000 if you meet me down at that cross street down the hill there. And he says, what if you don't make it? I said, well, then you won't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I said, you will get paid if I'm not dead. Uh, if they catch me or if I make it, you're going to mm -hmm. get $10,000. He said, well, that's a mighty strong bet on your part, Mr. Reeves. I said, well, I'm ready to take it. So uh, Friday afternoon came, and I guess uh, 20 minutes to 5, I was in that office, and I just in that, and I took the curtain off the wall, and I already had me um, the, the brooms and mops over there are, are like our hoe handles here. They're thick. And I'd cut one in two, and I got a rope from somebody in the prison, and I put them around the ropes, and I had them in my pants. And when I got in there, I, I put that tied a bowling around those two bars. It was like music notes, wide mm -hmm. but thin like this. And, and and I put that stick in between it and twisted it like you would a rubber band, and it brought them right together. I mean, it took it took some power to put yeah. it in. And I stuck that, uh, stuck that uh, stick in one end, and I went to do the other one. And when I turned it loose, it come loose and it knocked the knuckles off of my hand. Oh, <laughs> oh it hurt record. so bad I couldn't breathe. I mean, <laughs> you get hit across the knuckles that hard with a big it, did, it didn't knock them off, but I declare it, it was unbelievable, like sharp pain. You know, you'd had an axe to it. Anyhow, when I quit dancing, I, I put it back in and <laughs> did it again. And I made sure it was stuck. <laughs> now that I get up on, uh, I'd stack some chairs up, the windows up high like this. And, I, uh, I start to go through. My head goes through. The thing's wide. I didn't realize my chest is way bigger than my head. And all of us <laughs> is, whoa, boy. So I got I got there, and I took my, the shirt off I had, and I hung it kind of on the bar there. And I got to go in, and I went, <sighs> let all the air out, all the air out. And now it's just pouring down rain on my head on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I get hung between that bars, and I'm telling you, I thought I was fixing to die. I mean, I'm fixing to pass out. I'm going like this year trying to scream, and I finally go like this a little bit, and it catches. Oh, oh my gosh, I could finally breathe after three minutes, it felt like. I'm sure it wasn't, but it was a long time. And, oh, and then I get to my hips. My hips won't go. I have to undo my blue jeans, and they fall <laughs> around my ankles, and I fall out on that ground six feet down the <laughs> top of my head. Jesus. I try to with a rake, try to reach and get my shirt, and it folds back inside. Now I don't have a shirt. I'm all my whole skin's off of my chest. It's it's not bleeding, but it's it skin's gone. Yeah. Oh my my. So there was a little um, setback about four feet from the long ride of the, of the prison to this this part, I guess, and like an L shape. And that whole side of the prison was was scaffolded up to the fourth floor. So with one hand, I grabbed the scaffolding, and the other one, I get get between a brick because the guard tower was just right there, and I had to stay and climb that thing. And they couldn't see you if you they stayed on the side like that? that? Okay. That little, that little <laughs> enclosure. So one hand on a brick and the other one on the scaffolding, and my foot on that scaffolding to push myself up. So I made it up to the fourth floor, and I got up on top, and I just lay there. And I have asthma, and I didn't bring my inhaler, and I was wheezing so bad <laughs> from all that exertion. Oh, and the rain pouring down on me, and it was rather frisky. So I crawled all the way to the end 
of the building. And now one floor below me is uh, the Sally Port Guard Tower, and it's half of it. It's it's in in the building, like in the office building, and it's built out like a half of a silo sticking out. Mm-hmm. And the guy's got the mounted machine gun there. And he got thick bulletproof glass in front of him so that they, they can't, they can't, somebody from outside can't mm-hmm. shoot him. So I lay there and there was a guard coming. I knew the guard and his wife and a little boy and uh, that three or four years old little fella. And so she brings him in, in the rain. She got a double umbrella. I remember the top. I've never seen an umbrella like it's cut in two, two umbrellas on one stick. Huh. So looking down on it, it was just... <laughs> Anyway, and so she comes to the <laughs> she comes to the door with him, and when she starts back, she gets I guess about fifty feet from it. I jump down on top of that guard tower. It's tin roof like a silo, and it went bam. And that guy in there held it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and when I did, I just took one leap, and I leaped way out. And I don't know how far it is. It's maybe thirty feet down. And there was a, a pile of sand where the steam shovel had piled it up like a cone. And I hit that just like a skier would hit the side of something. My feet buried up almost to the, the knees. I didn't even fall down. And I ran straight towards that woman and little boy so he couldn't shoot me. And then I got past him and went around and down. And, I mean, I was stretching out, and I had a smile ear to ear. I was gone. And the sirens blew in behind me. And I heard blam, 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 right behind me, and the horn blew it. And that woman was on the sidewalk knocking the parking meters down trying to run over me. And so there was a car parked down there, and I run behind it. And she swerved and knocked the whole bump off of that car and tore her car up. And she's like a devil face screaming at me, and that little boy's holding on, standing up in the front seat. I'm like, what in the world? So there's, there's a fence there about chest high. And I jump up on that to, to get away. I can't go to the lawyer now. Here, this, yeah. this woman's worse than a policeman. She, yeah. she got it. <laughs> so I jump over that, and there's Betty Glass inside the top of that fence. And I really get my arms and hands cut up pretty deep. Oh, my, my. I mean, once I saw it, I kind of yeah. got over it. And I jumped down on the other side, and Murray had given me $200, slipped it. And I had that in my shoe. And pair of runner and and somebody had plowed that ground knee deep and it was mucky and wet and my feet sh- stuck in that and my shoes came off and I lost my two hundred dollars. Oh jeez! Uh. <laughs> Here I am running across that place. Oh my! And I go and I'm fixing across the street and I see a muscle car back into a driveway. They have they know where to go. Just bang 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 when something like this happens. So then I go across the block on the other side, a lot of big, big, uh, big trees there and shrubbery rhododendrons. And I see the lawyer's car and I, I yell, Hey, and he, he puts on the brakes and I run, jump in. I am all bloody now. And he liked the shit. <laughs> he, he stood there trying to light a cigarette and he couldn't get it lit. <laughs> I said, let's go, let's go. He said, man, you can't go like that. Nobody can see us, man. The whole place is fogged up. So he took his leather coat off and gave it to me. And we took off and went towards uh, Hamburg. And I called Mari from a gas station, and she told me to go back. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Inspector Rodriguez is going to be here any minute, and I got the papers in the house. I said, put them under a rock. I don't care. Do something. <laughs> anyway. So we got to a derelict boat where a guy was out on uh, uh, bail for for murder. And uh, anyway, that's the start story. We went on that boat, the big Amazon woman and the man with dementia poking me in the chest. And and I finally, I, they took me to Holland to the border, and I got across. What a story! I must have went across the military base. <laughs> wow. I- that's the one out of that's the short form of the, of yeah, the escape yeah, from Germany. Yeah, yeah, right. You had the whole story. You got to read the book. That's yeah, right. Right. that's right. It's, uh, it's even more unbelievable than yeah. that. One last break to mention our sponsor, Timothy P. Pope. When it comes to financial planning, he's got your back, so you can focus on the mission ahead. Timothy P. Pope is a certified financial planner helping professional pilots design and execute smart financial planning strategies. From retirement planning and investment management to military transition and tax planning, he's your financial planning partner. Timothy P. Pope, certified financial planner, helping professional pilots make the most out of life. So Roger, that's just that story of escaping prison was just one of the many stories you have 
in pri- going to different prisons, like we mentioned before. Um, you ended up in a prison in the United States and Australia. Tell us a, the the one other prison story I want to hear about is this co-ed prison you went to because it just sounded so weird. Yeah, I've never heard of anything like that, yeah. and that was here in the United States, yeah. right? I don't believe anybody believed this story, but yeah. it's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was uh, after I was sentenced. Uh, the uh, it was in I, I got sentenced December the twenty first, uh, nineteen eighty two, and then about the first, second, or third day of January nineteen eighty three, they put me on a bus out of Terminal Island and took me to Pleasanton, California. That sounds and, nice. <laughs> they stopped. They stopped at several prisons on the way and let people on and off. He was in a little cage. He was there all day, and they had a, a guy that didn't even know which way to turn and stop. But they had to show him with his shotgun. I mean, I'd never seen a guy guard that dumb. But no, don't stand that way, Bill. Turn this way. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd get off and stand there. I mean, like like an idiot. <laughs> Anyhow, they they let him off and on, and finally went to Pleasanton, pulled up there, and. Uh, we just got off and went in and it was, it was beautiful flowers everywhere and a good lawn and men and women walking street clothes on look, looked like he was downtown in a, in a very nice place. And there was three big chalets and the office buildings. And uh, there was a pretty girl there with a long skirt on and reached the ground and she gone and she waved to us a little bit and her name was Judy later on. I found I knew, knew, knew them all. Anyhow, there was 400 women there, and they had 200 men, soldiers. Oh. Uh, soldiers. <laughs> we better well been. Anyway, and, uh, and, and those girls was, was pretty. They, many of them, I found out later on, was, worked in banks. And uh, uh, they, would, they would have a boyfriend or some man that was building a house or wanted a loan for $400,000, and, and she's a secretary, so she signs uh, the bank manager's name to it, and then he doesn't pay it back. Oh. So she gets bank fraud and gets five years. So she's there. So was this like a minimum, like a white collar prison no, sort of? Maximum. It was white collar. Oh, no, I don't know. It was some terrible women and stuff they'd done in there. But for men, it was medium. And for women, it was max. Ah. So uh, the men was in one chalet. And this, I understand this was m- made for Patty Hearst. And so somebody mm. went out there and put this thing out there in the countryside. And I tell you what, those women were hot, and they'd put it on, man. They was they didn't care. Some of them doing life. <laughs> so they, and uh, we had a dance once a month, and I tell you what, I had a prison garden. dance. We had Come a prison on. dance in the band. <laughs> they had their own band, and we played, and they turned the lights down. Them women would just put it on you. And I, I had a guard for five hundred dollars. Bring me a quarter, Chevy's Regal in, and I'd give it to the girls. <laughs> We'd dance a little, and oh, and they was every kind of way they could figure out to have sex and i'll tell you it was just so many ways that just <laughs> and those guards would some of them were just determined to catch people and there was wheat that went up the field and some of them would take their days off and get binoculars and lay out there all day long trying to catch them. oh my gosh <laughs> so and the gals got pregnant and they'd take the babies and they'd cry and they'd be in mourning and all kind of i mean so they finally Closed, took the men out. And <laughs> they finally figured yeah, out that wasn't a good idea. Out. Can't they figure out why they, these women are keep getting pregnant. Yeah, it's well, the weirdest thing. All these people with some with nothing to lose anymore. And yeah, yeah. But they said after they took the men out that the pregnant rates was, was the same as the guards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they fell in love with the guards. Oh, wow! Jeez. One fellow left and he came back with a helicopter and took took his girlfriend out. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was free for all. I'll uh, I'll have to tell you about my friend, my cellmate Mike. He was he was just wonderful, absolutely most delightful person you could ever. Imagine. I love that almost all of your stories with these people either start with they're either the worst or the oh, best. I don't fool. <laughs> they're with wonderful or they're the worst person ever. <laughs> oh, anyway, he was he was a young lad and. uh he was in in the military, and he was over in Germany, and he did something, and he wanted his paperwork destroyed. So there's a little wooden courthouse there, about the size of one room, and he set it on fire. He got 25 years for burning the federal courthouse. Oh, jeez! So they had him there, but he could take any phone book, two inches thick, and just take it and rip it like it was one piece of paper. Wow! Uh, just any of them. It was like 
phenomenal. Wow. Was he like a really big? Did he look like a big, strong no. guy? No. Really? He, he was big, but he was yeah. probably 6'2 and 220 or something, but he was just just unbelievable what he could do with caring for. Anyway, he would uh, he would go into the the ladies chalet, put on maybe a trench coat or something and a wig and go in there and he would uh, he was the rooster. <laughs> <laughs> the rooster in the house. <laughs> so anyhow they cl- they uh, they close a they close the place down. Somebody told on him. Maybe she wanted to be first. I don't know what the <laughs> deal was. <laughs> so he kicked the window out. Uh, there was a, like a the whole back of the room was like a, looked like train it was stained glass windows not stained glass stained glass where, where you could a little bit of a tent to it yeah okay and and it embedded into concrete in the blocks he kicked it all out and ran out of the building he came back to our room and he looked like a, a young stallion with his nostrils just flaming he, <laughs> He was so excited to get out of that place. So they knew it was him, but they couldn't prove it. So then uh, he uh, he didn't he didn't last too long. So he uh, he got him a job in the kitchen, and he was in the freezer room. <laughs> and him and him and the girl was going at it. She was so pretty, curly black hair and bluish eyes, and. Uh, they was going at it on the freezer table. I guess they'd put them a blanket up there where they oh chop up God. the vegetables in the <laughs> freezer. And the lady guard walked in just to get something or something, and there they were. And she said, get down, Mike. He just smiled and said, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> so she had to call for backup. And they said it took six of them. And they were laughing to pull him off. And they said his, his pink pecker was just smoking in that cold air. <laughs> Standing there in the press. <laughs> Plot twist. I didn't, I didn't get to see Mike anymore. They put him on a bus. They call it diesel therapy. And they, you ride a bus for six months, you don't get off. And you just go into Phoenix one night, and they'll hose you down with that stuff and give you a jumpsuit and maybe a sandwich. And next morning, it's a tepid cup of coffee and smoke. <laughs> You're on that bus again for 12 or 14 hours. And maybe you go to Chicago, Oklahoma. And you get off of it, and they just ride you constantly. It's just the prison like transfer bus, but you just you just stay on. You don't have a destination. No destination. You just ride. That way, you can't write writs. You can't write things. You can't get phone calls. It made some big guys cry. They call it diesel therapy. I can't imagine that'd be like worse than sitting in a little cell, though. At least watching the country go by. Like, yeah, but you have no access to any like nothing. Not even exercise. I guess that's true. It's just they, they say it breaks them. Really? So it's like commuting. That's what we always said. Commuting's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> no, it ain't the same. It's, un- it's uncomfortable, I can tell you that. Uh, oh, man. Yes. So then you never heard from Mike again? No, I didn't, but it, I'd like to. Though. Mike, if you're out there, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Mike, hey, yeah, let us know what happened. You. Maybe they're listening to this in the bus as they're driving. We need right a now. post diesel right. therapy <laughs> update. <laughs> they, they only keep you on there six months. Oh, man. So that was a known thing. Like people would say, "Oh, d- diesel therapy," and you right. knew what that was. Of course, oh, he's on. Not many people got it, but it, yeah. And then, but then they write next to Ken, like they wrote Mari and says, "Your husband has been caught having sex with another inmate." Oh. They don't tell you what kind it was. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Oh no. So, in your book, Roger, uh, in Smuggler, you you go into detail of all of your different visits to prison. So yes. we're going to leave some of those stories. Yeah. In the and book. there's still smuggling that happens yeah. after the airplane, more on boats and yeah. tons of drugs and Australia and yeah. Canada and all over the place. So I think we're going to leave some of that for people to discover in your yeah. book because how much was it? The cocaine $400 million worth of co- yeah. co- with an old story. We'll leave that out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that story is in- that incredible. That story is incredible. Roger's last voyage. <laughs> the last one. It's, and yeah. then, and how things are in the yeah. Australian prison. It's just, it's, yeah. but anyway, we can't. In the Southern Ocean. We can't give away all the secrets here. Yeah. So yeah. we encourage everyone to buy your book and finish uh, your incredible story. And even the the German prison escape. That's just yeah. like. The, this the, is a little the, bit that we talked the cliff about. notes of yeah. the real story. Yeah. And so that that's that's the thing. You gotta <laughs> if you like these stories, you have to read the book. Yeah. Because there's there's so much more, even the beginning. So with all those visits to prison, you said thirty three total years. Yes. You finally get out. Is your family still there? Are they interested in seeing you? Have you been in contact? What is, tell us about getting out and what that was like. Okay, on, on the last time I'd been in, uh, 
19 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, until I, I was 18 years in Australia, and I talked with Mari almost every day and the children, and she raised the children and uh, did the best she could. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I came back to the United States, they slammed me upside the wall. I was in a good prison in Australia, and they, they put me in, in isolation. I mean, it hurt me. And I got one phone call a month. I paid the lawyer, Cannon, out of San Francisco $7,500 to represent me. He didn't even pick up a phone. <laughs> so uh, uh, they kept me in, in, in isolation there. I guess I'd, I'd cut a hole in Metropolitan Detention Center when it was new back in 1990, 91. And I uh, was on a National Ge Geographic uh, documentary. And I bragged about it, <laughs> about, <laughs> about, the, about the place down there. And so after I was there three or four days, I wonder what in the world they put me in general population. I haven't done anything. And the little Judas window slid open. And a nice looking man said, I'm, I'm uh, Associate Warden Short. We saw your National Geographic documentary, and it does me pleasure to keep you in isolation. I never could get out. Mm. They, I, I, I stepped on somebody's toes. <laughs> so anyway, they uh, they sent me to Oklahoma City after, oh, no, six or seven months. And I, I went up, oh, th there was a terrible prison up there at the top of that hill. I forget what the name of it is. And then they sent me to Oklahoma on, on that uh, Con Air. And... Uh, while there, I just saw how corrupt the system is. I mean, money-wise, it's, mm -hmm. it's bad. It's evil. The United States prison system is evil. It uh, the whole thing is just should be absolutely started over. They they started off with the to, to do penance. Well, there's no penance anymore. It's just punishment. Right. It's been punishment from the person that arrest you, the way they treat you, to the prosecutor, to the judge, to the prison guards to the parole people, to the person at the halfway house, they all think it's their, their duty to stick you, to hurt you, to do something to make you pay for your sins, whatever they were, whenever they were. There's no doubt about that. So uh, uh, I was in Oklahoma City, and I was there to get for a parole here, and you're supposed to give you one within 90 days. So after about six, seven months, I hadn't had one. So I was there, and I asked a nice lady. She said, oh, yes, after when I got off the bus. There was a man here from Washington, to give you a parole hearing, but uh, you didn't get your the plane that you here, so he said he'd be back next year. <sighs> so then I'm put back in, I'm put on the floor, but I, every two hours I have to go sign in, and if I don't sign in, I get put in isolation. Now they want to keep up with me. So, uh, so then a few days later, or a couple of weeks later, I see the lady, and I says, is there any way? And she said, would you like, would you consider asking for a parole on the record? I said, ask anything. She said, you want me to do that? And I said, sure. <laughs> so she sent a, an email, and the next day I got my parole. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And they sent me to Terminal Island, and uh, what a place. It's for the, for the dying. It's a lot of old people there and nasty, nasty guards, a lot of Mexican guards there. And they don't like us white boys. And uh, I, I go into a place and bunk so close together, my head's right next to another fella. I can reach over it with my arm and touch fellas on both sides. Oh. They all stick bags on their legs. Oh. Uh, and and I push a fella in the wheelchair. And uh, I, there's a woman named Andretti there. She's just out looking just like a little mouse, just looking. And I'll just I'll tell you how it is. There's one poor fellow with a bag on his leg. He's so skinny, he's dying of cancer. And he goes for a chow hall with his with his walker roller. And uh, she sees that his shirt's not tucked in. He's already gone all that way and got almost to his food truck. And she comes up, out, out, tuck your shirt in. So he can't, I mean, what's he mess? So he just goes on back without eating. Oh. I lost my card and uh, my ID card, something that when I was working out. And so the uh, guard said they had it at the captain's office. I went, she caught me, it's raining. She said, no, you don't go to the captain's office, stand right there. And I stood there for over an hour. In the rain? In the rain. And finally, she said, no, stand there. I'll get it one. So I just finally, I had to pee. I said, do what you got to do. <laughs> I went. And, oh, it was just one thing after the other. I came out of the chow hall and... Uh, uh, the guy said, I'll cut your hair. I hadn't had a haircut in a long time. And uh, he said, when you come out to child, we'll turn right. And I, the barbershop's right at the first one. Well, I came out, 
and they was two Mexican, one guard and one captain. And I turned before I got to him. Hey, come here. Walk between us. Okay, so I walked between us, and the one guard, he went like, oof, like that to me. And I said, I bet I could outrun you. <laughs> oh, tackled me to the ground, threw me into four weekends isolation. Just <laughs> for saying that? Just for saying that, yes. It was just like, and the white guard's like, don't bother him, man. Don't say nothing. Like, leave it alone. Yeah. It was just, that was just, that's the, that's what it is. And then uh, got out there, and there was those people in the wheelchairs and knee replacements, and we was there, you know, it had just been raining, the asphalt's all wet, and we get once a week, we can go get us some little little food and goodies at the store, and you put your thing in, so there's 50 or 100 of us out there, and two guys have a fight, the only fight I saw there, and one of them knocked the other one down, bam, over on the grass, 100 feet away from us, way over there, oh, and the guards come running, I mean, they jump on them, bam, and the whistle goes off, and they... 12 of them pile on each one of them. And one guy comes with us on the ground, on the ground, on the ground, you sons of bitches, on the ground. And he throws them out of the wheelchair, pushes the guy that's on the ground. And he said, I can't get down my knee. And he just throws him down. And then they all just high five, baby, high five. And wow. they're in the ninja suits. That's what's happening in American prisons. It, it needs changing. Wow. I mean, something horrible needs to be done. I mean, not horrible to those people. Just it's horrible. Yeah, it's it's mean. It's ugly. They got the the Mexicans against the blacks, and the blacks against the Mexicans and the whites. And it's just uh, I uh, I play chess, and I play chess with some black fellas, and uh, I decided I wanted to watch TV, and they have these TV rooms, and I walk up to the Mexican place, and I says, they said, no, senor, this is for, this is for the Latinos. I said, I speak Spanish. I huh? I like to watch. <laughs> no, senor, no, por favor. Very nice. And, uh, okay, so I walk across, and here's the guy that I played chess with, a black fella. Hey, this, this, get out of here, man. Get out of here. This, this is black TV room. I said, man, we played chess. Yeah, this is different. This is the black TV room. This is for the blacks. You can't come in here, man. And they say a few choice words. So I had to go around, and I go to the white TV room. They got a whole bunch of old guys in there in wheelchairs and long hair and cigarette smoke on their mustaches. And, hey, show us your paperwork. What are you talking about? I show us your paperwork. You can't come in here without your paperwork. Bullshit. I can still come in here. What paperwork? What, what, what you in prison for? Oh, oh. You might be a pedophile. You might be a child molester. You might be this. Mm. Something that can't come in here. So, I mean, it, it was insulting to me. And you So, wait. Through. So, if you're a black guy and you go to the black TV room, do they still ask you for paperwork? I'm sure they Or is did. that just a white TV room? I thing? don't know. I didn't go to the back. <laughs> I, I think they're a little bit I guess that's lit. true. They turned they, you away. See? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you go to the chow hall, and you only sit at certain tables. And these are over here for the child molesters, and these are over here for the pedophiles, and these are here for the for the snitches, and these, these are for those, and this is the black table, and this is the brown table, and this is for the good old white boys. Is that your table? I didn't even want to sit there. I mean, it's it's, it's insulting to me. It's yeah. Like, just, plum. So where did you sit? I, I sat with the white table, of course. You have to. <laughs> you didn't have a choice. You have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Said. But after I showed my paperwork, he said, oh, come on. Oh, now come you're on one on of the boys, now. huh? Well, yeah, yes. And oh, then now you are a hero. So, but I I, I detest stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's it's just absolutely yeah, that's gross. Who, who, are they, who are they to think? You're all in prison. We're all doing time. We all got the same color uniform on. Yeah. Hi, hi am I? No, pi- no paella at this one. Exactly. No, absolutely. <laughs> Some bad, bad. The food's all right, but it's no good. It's just, it's oh. just 2,200 calories a day, and that's it. And if you don't misbehave, if you misbehave, they'll make it in a loaf. You get your butter and your sugar and your salt and everything in the loaf, and they'll bake it, and they'll stick it to you on a on – a, on a, That's your 2,200-calorie loaf? That's it. I, really? That's it. That's all they do. So some of them, say, like at Lompoc, they deserve it for some reason. Those guys, they'll save their feces and throw it on the guards and oh. urine when they're in the open that door and they throw it out. Well, they got two doors, <laughs> one one solid door and then the guard door, and they can reach there and unload that little thing and they put it put it on a stick like a, a pizza patch, you know. Oh, mm, my that God. Bad. That's that's all you're going to get. <laughs> they just, they, yeah. They, they, but they, do you ever see any stuff like that in the European prisons? No, because it doesn't breed the not at all. savagery like that, right? Not, not whatsoever. Never saw anybody get hurt or Australia. Uh, yeah, nothing. 
I mean, it happened down there, but uh, it was uh, uh, when when I was there, one fella cut the other fella's head from off, and uh, but he come in on purpose. The, a guy had raped his son, and so he came in prison to get him. Oh wow! Oh. Took a knife and come up behind him right out there. And Jeez. <laughs> took his head off his shoulder. Holy cow! <laughs> wow. So, okay. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it gets violent sometimes. <sighs> But Long Park was a bad place. I saw a guard get killed there. Other one knife sticking plumb through him. Yeah, it was. It yeah, was it's awful place. stuff. Everybody killed there every month when it's I. It's amazing there. you came out. You're such a nice guy after 30 plus years of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It didn't touch me. Just the years bothered me being gone yeah. so long. Okay, so speaking of the years being gone, you do finally get out. Yes. Tell us what it's like. Your family's waiting for you. I might cry. <laughs> I, I might cry. Uh, yeah, me too. Yeah. I uh, I came I came here and came through the door, and uh, got a hug and a kiss from Mari, and I said I I want to get rid of these clothes, and she said all oh, your clothes are hanging. They, I knew they were ironed and in the shirts sent to the laundry and whatever she and sent them to the cleaners what needed. So I went in there and just scrub for the longest time, just get all of the smell off of me, and. Uh, Went in there and put on my clothes, and they felt so good to put on crisp clothes and colorful stuff. When was the last time you wore those clothes? Forty years ago. <laughs> so I, uh, um, and I put on a nice pair of shoes, some slick socks, <laughs> uh, knee socks. I just want to feel like I was dressing up. And I took a step in those shoes, and the and the sole stayed on the floor. <laughs> All the strings had rotted in them. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was Rip Van Winkle to come on for 40 years. The, the, shit, the clothes are still hanging in there, still good. They were really nice trousers and stuff. I just, uh, people to say, wow, nice trousers. And you nice still fit in them. Fit in them, same size it was. <laughs> None of went away. Same weight. Uh, so I came in here and I sat down, and the, the place mass was the same, the same pictures on the wall that we had in our home. For, this is a little condominium, but since she had saved the nice pieces, we got that piece out of a chicken house when we first got married up in Canada, and I brought it back in the airplane as, as uh, luggage, and we took all the chicken house crud off of it, and that's the first piece we re redid from an old missionary that lived next door to him. Huh. Anyhow, just all these pieces in the chair here and the yeah. table, just stuff that we've had for nearly 60 years. So I just said, and I just cried. I just sat here. I just couldn't help crying. And, and I, I think I cried for three days. I see pictures of her when she was 40. I wasn't there. 50, I wasn't there. 60, I wasn't there. 70, I wasn't there. I think, wow. I mean, I might have been out sometimes yeah. with her in between it. But all those birthdays, yeah. I wasn't there. Just beautiful and young and vivacious. And the children just watch them grow. I, won't look, I don't even want to look at those pictures anymore. I just wasn't there. I was, I was a fool. It's yeah, be gone that long for that, and the government's at, at fault too. I, I mean, our society is that that we demonize certain things that shouldn't be demonized. It's just let's just, just have crime be crime for well, sure. So uh, it took me about three days, and I finally said, "Buck up! Ain't no good in crying anymore. Let's just go for it." So I, I did, and I was in. <clears throat> I, I had uh, I was on federal parole. And I had to go down every week and pee in the bottle. I said, listen, I've been in 33 years. How many urine tests have I had? <laughs> you think if I did drugs, I, I wouldn't be. And then I had to go to psychiatric treatment once, once a week to see. So, and that lady was the nicest lady. She was a, had a bunch of young'uns. And we just talked about her and her young'uns and what we did and what we <laughs> <laughs> and after six months, they said, hey, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I quit wasting our time. <laughs> exactly. Well, it really speaks to the special uh, relationship that you and Mari have and the love that you guys share for her to still be here right? after all these years. What did that mean to you? And what was that like to be reunited? It was just, I didn't expect anything different. I talked to her every day yeah, and all those years. But I, I, it, it would have killed me if she would have, wouldn't have been here for whatever. I mean, it would just have been devastating. So yes, I did. I did expect her. I knew she was going to be here. So therefore, but it's just like 
probably almost like a blind man that received his sight when you come home after mm. 33 years in the prisons. Some of those were dark places. They wrote a book about where flies don't land. It was so dark. So, yes, and the evil around you. That, that's the punishment. They don't, the guards don't need to punish you. It's there. <clears throat> And, but most of the the friends you made in prison that were there, the people that were there for for a long time, 10, 12, 15 years, whatever, what 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 are the percentage of them that their their wives are still there after that? Or I mean, it's very low, right? I, I met two people, and in, in, that were doing sentences like I did, that their wives stayed with them. Three, two. The Andonia brothers is probably the most horrible sentence I've ever heard of. The evil Judge Eidman. These two young fellows had a gold shop in San Francisco. It wasn't one of the big ones where they sell billions of wood. Mm-hmm. And there's a guy from Argentina come in, a drug dealer, and wanted to trade gold coins for money. Well, they asked their lawyer, and they said, well, get his name and, and report it each time. So they did. And he kept coming in. I don't know how many years he kept coming in, changing the money for gold. And he did it 101 times. And then the, they, pro- they prosecuted him. And he went before Eidman, and it's a five-year sentence. And he gave them five years on each count consecutive. They're doing 100, 505 years. He wanted to give the longest system in, in history. And they're up here in Lompoc Penitentiary, and they can't get out for the rest of their lives. Beautiful family, beautiful men, beautiful wives, children crying in the visiting room. Now, those children are 30 years old now. Yeah. And they still can't get out. They need a pardon from our president, the only way to move them. It's wow. just it's just evil. It's just it's just horrible. Yeah. They didn't do anything. They're innocent. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things where for folks, <clears throat> at least myself, I don't know anyone in the prison system. I don't have I, I have no exposure to it. I, I'm and I imagine most people are just ignorant about it. Yeah, it's it's they America's it's a dirty little secret yeah. that nobody wants to uh to deal with unless you're forced to. Yeah. yeah exactly. Otherwise you just it's yeah, not. It's not a thing. You don't even think about it. I, I I didn't know anything. I thought that you had to get caught. I laughed with those airplanes. They didn't catch me. I got away with it. Yeah. I didn't know that if two or three of your friends tell on you, it's just like they catch you red-handed. Yeah. It's just witness so, against you. Let me ask you. I mean, I, I can't tell. I guess the one thing I want to say that that is after all this that you've been through and all the years in prison and all the near death experiences and stuff, and you know, we we come here to your house and your daughter's here and your wife's here and. You guys just seem like the normal, nice, loving family, and 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 I think that's that's incredible that you guys have been able to preserve that. And yes, you lost all of this time, and that's a tragedy. But now you just you're making the best of what time you have left. Absolutely. And and I think that's I commend you guys for that because that's that's a big that's a big hill to climb. Yes, I was blessed. I mean, I've been blessed uh, all my life. It just looked like I've had the angel look after me. Yeah, and, and, uh, even to, that I married Marty and Mari, and uh, uh, that, that she's who she is is, is a good person. I, and I know I'm not a bad person. I'm not evil. I mean, I was an outlaw, but I'm I'm not much of a criminal at all. I was strong enough to kind of take care of myself, but I certainly didn't have it. I carried the needle and thread in prison to sew people up with, and some people took the shank. You know, I don't want to stick anybody. <laughs> Roger, I got shanked again. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't show them if they so got me stuck. Up. If they got sliced. I could put stitches in. Okay. Them. Yeah. yeah. The puncture wouldn't be a little tougher, huh? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's. So so one of the questions I've always had in the back of my mind as I've read your story is, if you wouldn't have, if if you never would have been offered to pick up that load of pot in the 182 and started this whole thing, what do you think you would have done? I would have stayed with the fire department and I was buying two houses a year that time and fixing them up and flipping them or yeah, cause you had good side hustles too. Oh, absolutely. Antiquing and you're doing that and painting, painting houses and painting crew. And yeah, I was making, I, was, I didn't need to do that at all. I had two houses, a new car, an airplane. What in the world I need to go all load of marijuana for. I'm making more money than I, I we, we didn't know anybody. It was like it, it was fun. To tell you the truth, it was it was adventurous, and it was a lot of money. So you like paid how, how good you could do it, and and, and I did want to take three hundred thousand dollars and go go to the farm. I said, "Wow, that's uh, my idea was on the." And it's funny because uh, not funny, but I mean, it's interesting. Back then, you thought about the consequences. You you went to an attorney, mm-hmm. and you're like, 
you know, for, for the odds of getting caught and the amount of money. And if I did get caught and, and, and I think that's, you know, you, you looked at it analytically, you penciled it out and be like, this is probably worth it. Absolutely. And then, and then it just, but then it just, (laughs) and and I think that what the, the, the thing that I noticed in your story is that everything was going good when it was just you. Yes, absolutely. And, and you were just the guy. And, you know, I think if if you would have went in and started the whole thing as and you made up a fake name and, you know, made up some fake backstory and were just like this, the, the guy that comes in and picks up the stuff. And and uh, it seems like when you started to get other people involved and it got bigger and you had other people working, that's when, you know, what then it, it got was, out of control. If you just can't imagine this sentiment in California, 1973, 74, 75. Like I was a hero. <laughs> it was like, if, if anybody didn't get it across, Roger can, you know, wow, wow. And I hold so many loose till I brought the price down from a hundred dollars a pound to $60 a pound. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but it was like, it, the people we knew, and well, it was, we, we went to church and, and we quit going to church because we felt like hypocrites, <laughs> but that group didn't know. But the other group, the, hmm. uh, I don't know, the, I don't know what you call bohemian group of, of the hippies beats and yeah, a whole that bunch and there's a, a whole bunch of it with it. It just it seemed like I was I was welcome anywhere I went. Like come sure. on here, Roger, you know. So, yeah, and then they changed that stuff. Boy, they went from five years to life just right bam. Yeah. So, I think one of the main themes that I walk away after reading your book and meeting you and talking to you is that one, you're a survivor. But, but two, your perseverance when you start to do something is really incredible. And in your book, you talk a lot about your childhood and some of the experiences you had and maybe some of the things that made you the way you were. Can you share a few stories growing up with our listeners that maybe they can help to understand sort of your character a little bit and maybe how you were formed? I think that I was born this way. Yeah. That I think we are. My mother said you couldn't take me to the beach. I just walked right into the waves. <laughs> when I was a little bitty fella. So uh, uh, I remember wanting to crawl, crawl, climb a big, tall tree when I was like four years old. And I wouldn't come down, and I was waving at a family reunion, and they was all sucking their breath in because I guess it was about pencil thin up there where I was. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother said, Roger, if you'll come down right now, we'll go tomorrow and buy you those goats you want. And I climbed right down out of that tree. <laughs> and I smelt like a billy goat for years. <laughs> I tied him up. Then I wanted a horse. And I got a Mexican pinto, seven years old, and that thing was mean. And I couldn't ride him. He'd bite me, and I beat him back. He nearly jerked my head off. <laughs> I beat him on the ear. <laughs> and uh, so my daddy just tied him right with a halter right to a post and gave me a switch. said, ride him all you want to. <laughs> So they brought another little horse out, and I hid that one. So I, I wanted him to be beautiful. I mean, just gorgeous pinto. Anyway, but between learning to ride that horse at nine years old, and I could ride mules before that, but that little horse would rub you off, run onto something, lay down in the water and wallow with you. It just anything you could think of. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I got got him mastered, and I was a one horse. Oh, I was proud of that horse. And could anyone else ride that horse? Was it no, just you? No, he would. He would. He'd give him. A, he'd give him a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that that helped, and I, I lived in a, uh, a big old house out in the country, and my mother and daddy and seven little brothers and sisters, and I, uh, and my grandma built like a, a house side on, and she ate with her, but she had three rooms, and I reckon I can't remember when I didn't sleep with my grandma, hmm. and so I slept with her till I was fourteen years old, and uh, she she was make sure I was scrubbed up and, and we, we get on our knees side to bed and she'd pray around the world. The boys on the battlefield of Korea. I remember mm. I could tell when she's getting closer to home, <laughs> <laughs> so, but it gave me a sense. And I went to church yeah. I went and got the five year pen for Sunday school, <clears throat> read the Bible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we just, but my father was an alcoholic and, and we were a lot poorer than we should have been because you get drunk. He just, and now they call it alcoholism, but now they know you call it a drunk. You know, it's going to know how much money you got. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so anyway, he died uh, when I was 17 years old and had a baby sister, just six weeks old. And I stayed there on the farm with my mother and uh, farm raised chickens and raised tobacco and worked hard. And uh, so 
That, that was kind of my background, starting off with a three mule arm, a three mules and butchering hogs and cows and whatever. I can, I can skin one, <laughs> boil them. <I> just... <laughs> but, but part of that in your story, you know, you talk about you were poor for a long time. Yes. In how much of the that I wonder it was associated with the desire to make the money smuggling. Probably I don't know about that. It was a back deep thing. Uh, I didn't feel particularly poor mm-hmm. because my family was of people of substance. Yeah, and my great grandpa like settled the land, thousands of acres, and the other great grandpa. So I come from from good stock. And my other uncles and brothers and uh, uncles and aunts and all of them were very successful, built bridges and uh, had new cars and that, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But we just got to own and, – and when I was little, we wasn't. My daddy had semi, three semi-trucks and, and uh, farm and had one of the first tractors out there. But then he just got drunk by the time – from the time I was seven, eight, nine years old for the next ten years. So uh, – and and I, I know I just loved him dearly. I mean, he'd have me drive for him. I could hear feel his old whiskers on me, you know, and, and he'd say, <laughs> Roger's the best damn hog catcher in the county. Well, I was the best hog catcher in the county. <laughs> but if he had said, son, why don't you be a doctor? Why don't you do this or that, the other? And and looked at my report card and mm-hmm. said, I'm going to cut your butt if you don't put an A on that thing, you know. What are you thinking doing, wasting your time here? So that's what I needed mm. because I would have jumped through hoops to have pleased him. And uh, my mother was uh, too busy working in sewing factories and raising seven little young'uns and cooking on a wood stove and whatever, and it, she had her hands full. And she was hardworking and, and, a, and a really good woman. My daddy was a good person, too. He just drunk yeah he wasn't mad when he drunk but she was mad and it made a heap of dissension in the house sure uh one of my other favorite uh stories from your childhood is when of of course this shouldn't be a surprise to any of our listeners you decided to wrestle a bear (laughs) at this point if you've been through the few hours we've been talking to roger that shouldn't be a surprise tell us that story (laughs) well i gotta tell you the whole story because I uh, I heard that it was like the grapes of wrath. They were offering twenty dollars a day room and board in Canada for people that young men that could crop tobacco. That means harvesting. Mm-hmm. Well, I was a tobacco cropper from four years old. I get down and get that tobacco leaves off of the stalk, and uh, so I got me a little bit of money together. I was working in the logging woods, and I think I got thirty forty dollars together, and I put it in my suit, old paper suit bag suitcase and stuck my thumb out to go to Canada, 1,100 miles from where I was in Georgia. So I got up somewhere in South Carolina, and uh, I was out in front of a store there, and somebody, well, that's where they turned off, and I got my stump, thumb stuck out, and heat waves coming off of the highway. And here comes a car from back in the 30s, nice, pristine car, and he pulls to slow, slows down and pulled up. I opened the back door and threw my big old suitcase in there. And I get in the front seat, and he's a dapper black man. I mean, and he is drunk. <laughs> he takes off, and he misses second gear. And, <laughs> up, 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 up. and he goes on, and a big sees off on the wrong side, and a big semi drawing oh. blowing the horn, his head going down there. <laughs> and, and I said, Mr. Would you like me to drive? And he did nothing. And he got his head hat cocked over to the side real far. And I said, hey, Mr., there's a store up there. I hadn't had nothing to eat in a long time. Would you let me out? <laughs> he pulled off on that gravel. I jump out of that car and thank God that I was out of there. And he takes off with his wheel spinning. And my $40 is in that suitcase and my clothes on the back seat. Oh, oh no, no, no. I mean, it's like you, you lost a million dollars. <laughs> I was sick. And there's some people over there under a pecan tree on the nail kegs playing checkers. And I went over, Mr. Mr. That guy's got my suitcase and $40 in it. Would you take your truck and catch him? Ah, oh, look like it going mighty fast. I don't believe I catch him. Oh, good gracious, man. I go back out to the suit. And just, what am I going to do? I just got, just got the clothes I got on my back. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking down the highway and the heat waves coming off of it just sizzling. And I hear gravel behind me crunch. And I turn around and I can't believe my eyes. Hey, buddy, you forgot your suitcase. (laughs) 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 
<laughs> I hitchhiked on up and got to Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Am I happy to see you? Oh, man, I rejoice. So got to Washington, D.C., and I went to the Library of Congress or something. I was going to stay there two or three days on my way to Canada. And I met a, a girl from Holland. And we held hands and went through and did all the museums and things. She had quite a Dutch accent. And uh, so then we said goodbye. Her daddy was a newspaper correspondent from the Netherlands. And I uh, I went on up and got to... Uh, that Niagara Falls and man and woman picked me up and they took me home with them. He's a railroad engineer, big fluffy bed. And they just was so nice. I think they would have adopted me. I could have stayed there forever. <laughs> and the next morning, hey, they had a nice breakfast and they took me out to the, to the road where I could catch a good ride. And then I called a ride on over to Canada and I got a job picking tobacco at a beautiful farm, Belgian people and owned it. And, uh, so the, the work was hard. I mean, 40 acres of tobacco, and you got to put it in, 1,000 sticks a, a day, and two big Belgian draft horses. Well, I was the fastest and young, youngest one of the crew. They had people there from French, uh, French part of Canada, Quebec, all over. And it looked like around the table at the Tower of Babel, it must have been 15 languages spoken <laughs> when we was all set down to eat. And it was delightful. So... Uh, when the tobacco got up a little bit higher, you can go a lot faster. But those, that horse was breathing down my back. Every time I took a step, he put a one that big around right where my foot had been. <laughs> and I'd go around and put it, and they called it boats, but put the tobacco in the sled. So anyhow, when it got got faster, I could, could go in and you could uh, $20 a day, and you got a dollar to take the suckers behind the leaves on each each row. And I'd work the dark, so I was making them good money. And uh, so the boys from another farm came over. The one that helped me get the job said, would you like to go to a carnival? We're going to go to the fair in Tilsonburg, Ontario. Sure. So I come in, and they had the hot water in the greenhouse. I took a shower. on. So I just put on a pair of black slacks and a white shirt and got in the car, and we went. So we came to this, this huge carnival. So, I mean, we went into the first thing. They had a hoochie-coochie show. I think you paid a dollar fifty cents to go in. And then we went in there, and them gals had their tassels on, and one going one way and one going the other. <laughs> Boy, my eyes as big as saucers. I never saw nothing <laughs> like that in my life. No way they're going to have something like that in Georgia. Oh, my goodness. So we went on down the road. I, they, there was a pretty good fist fight in there. I won't tell about that, but it was delightful. <laughs> <laughs> just, just spectacular. <laughs> I jumped up on the table and was yelling for the winner. Oh, man. <laughs> so went on down, and there's a guy, a great big 300-pounder with a big flowing beard, and he's got five brand-new $100 bills in his hand. Five brand-new $100 bills. For anybody wrestle my bear and get all four feet off the ground or throw him. $10 anybody got guts enough to try. What's your name, young man? <laughs> <laughs> Roger Reed. Where are you from, Roger? I'm from Georgia. I might have known these yellow bellied Canadians ain't got guts enough to wrestle my bear. <laughs> and the crowd's flocking in. They done got a sucker now. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so, how much you weigh, Roger? I weigh 145 pounds. 145 pound man against six. Hundred pound beast, and he opened that little circus wagon door, and he threw me in. <laughs> so could people see the bear? Oh yeah, it was right in the whole oh. center, right out there. I was just there's hundreds of people there, the oh. whole, whole tent. I mean, it was it was a show. Well, that little bear wasn't so big when he started getting up. He got up all over that cage, <laughs> and I thought I better do it now. So I ran into him, wham, with 145 pounds and got him around the neck. We slammed in the side of that cage and everything was loose and made a lot of noise. <laughs> and that bear caught me just below the knees with something faster than lightning and laid me out horizontal. <laughs> and I hit that floor and it went wham, blam, slam. <laughs> Sick him, Roger, somebody said. <laughs> <laughs> And I got up, and it was the other way. And I, my feet was off the ground, and he just laid me out horizontal. <laughs> Blam. Oh, wow. wow. I think that happened about three times. And I said, I can't take much more of that. So I grabbed the 
top of that circus wagon and I hit that bear in the face with my shoes just hard as good and I ran into him <laughs> and we went stumbling towards the back of that chase and that sucker came unglued. I mean, <laughs> he ain't supposed to be doing that. That's that bad guy's pet with him. He probably sleeps with him. That bear hurt me. I mean, he's threw me 20 feet over into the and bounced on me, and he's trying to bite my head off. He had a big, big thing on him and pads yeah. on his head. And, I mean, he just tore my clothes off of me. My pants is ripped up, <laughs> and that guy snapped the chain on him and tried to pull him off. He ran over the owner and went back, and that chain got hooked, hooked on one of them stakes. Of the, <laughs> part of the tent fell down sideways. People stomping each other trying to get out there. And I was, he's sick him, you fuck. Oh, <laughs> So I asked the guy for my $10 and he told me to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got in the car. They had to help me. And I got out on, got out at the bunkhouse and I fell down. They had to get me up. I, I mean, I was traumatized. I could like been in a wreck. I'd been hurt. Oh, yeah. It's like you'd fought a bear. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next day I couldn't work for two days and it was Sunday. And, uh, the guy, the same guy that took me to the fair come out and I, I was, I was all right. I was hobbling around a little bit. He said, you want to go down to Turkey Point, Roger? And 60 miles away, I sure do anything. I can't work. So I got dressed with white, white pants and a shirt again, my straw hat. And I went down and I walked out on the pier to Turkey Point. I lost my friend. He went somewhere. And I walked out in. There's three pretty girls on the towels there. And I kind of nodded my head. And I went to the end of the pier. And there's some guys trying to throw me in the water. And I tossed them in. I had my clothes <laughs> on. And uh, so I came back and I... Uh, the heart dropper said, "Is that a high? Sc- is that a university ring?" And I said, "No, this is a, this is a high school ring." So oh, we don't have high school rings here in Canada. Could I look at it? And I said, "Sure." So I didn't. It was right, cracked, so I didn't want to take it. So I just showed her my ring, and she said a little bit. And I said, "You're from Holland, aren't you?" And she said, "Would you sit down here and tell me how you know about a boy from Georgia cropping tobacco up your nose about Dutch accents?" I said, "Well, international accents are just one of my hobbies." <laughs> just, just one I of many one. <laughs> <laughs> so that was over 60 years ago and we've been married almost that long now we fell in love bam wow that. It, and that's the very very short version of that story i mean at least you met mari that day yes you got her address right Tell we us this, and then you guys didn't see each other for a long time, and you lo- well, lost her address. Tell us that. End end this interview right, with well, that well, story. Well, it, it is just a lovely story. It's yeah. one of the most lovely. I don't know why I cut it short. Anyway, we sit on that towel, towel, and pretty soon the other two girls are gone. And then somehow or another, we moved to the beach with her towel, and we should, and, and time just stood still. I was just talking to one another. And uh, then here come a man, I guess, Four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Marty, we, we have to go. We have to blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, she got up and introduced me to her father, Hank, and she had to go. So I said, give me your address, please. And so we, she got a little slip of paper and uh, had a pencil. And I took my sh- knife out and sharpened, got sharpened. She wrote it beautiful handwriting on that slip of paper, and I put it in my pocket. And when she fell, left, I just felt empty. Like, wow. So... I, uh, I thought, this little town is not so big. I can't find her again. So I got walking up and down every street. <laughs> this little little place by the sea, you know, mm-hmm. one of those little places you just, cabins. And there she was in the backyard with a bunch of people. And she saw me, hey, you know. And so I, she talked to the people, and they invited me in. Well, I stayed there three or four hours. And, I mean, we were just entered. It was just fun. And so then I asked her, could you? Would you go out with me? There's a little place down there that you can get beer and a juke joint. I mean, a jukebox and young kids all play. No, she couldn't. I didn't know. I thought, well, maybe she's engaged or got a boyfriend. Or something mm. she can do that, but it didn't didn't feel like it. But I didn't realize it was Sunday, and well, she could never go to a place where they serve beer and that sort of thing. So with her father, there's Christian people, and it was just it was just out of question. She, she couldn't even hardly date. She had to be home by ten. Right. It wasn't dark in Canada by that time. So anyway. I uh, uh, I went back home and my mother was I uh, said I built a fire in the fireplace and she was making biscuits and she said well, you got a ro- girlfriend a girlfriend I said no mother but I met a girl in Canada who was just lovely if I ever get married I want to marry a girl like that she said what happened to her I said like an idiot I lost her address so you're back in Georgia at this I'm point. back in Georgia yeah. and I, I'm working on the railroad I got mm-hmm. a job on Atlantic Coast Railroad as a fireman 
so uh, I ride in the rails. And sometime that winter, I had a 58 Impala Chevrolet. That thing was pretty. And uh, I was going to work and had a flat tire. And I got out in the drizzling rain, and they had a wheel wheel in there. And, and I got so many shirts that I just I got them for graduating high school. I think I got 50 shirts. Everybody give me a shirt. And I, I'd throw them in the back of that car because it was just clean as a whistle. And my mother would wash and iron them when I got home. Well, as I rolled that wheel out of that tire out of that wheel well by the dim flashlight, I saw stuck to the bottom of that wheel, rusted almost in two, was the address of the beautiful girl in Canada. So, wow. I got that tire change, and I was staying at the YMCA in Waycross, Georgia. So I went in there, and they had Waycross. They had uh, stationery with a pencil. So I wrote her a little letter in pencil with a crooked lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it seemed like about a week later, I was on the train at Ludowisi, Georgia, and they handed me my mail up, which was one. one, And it was monogrammed stationery with beautiful ink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my face turned red. <laughs> 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 so I wrote her back a few letters and stuff and so she said she's going to be at the same place at Turkey Point in August and you're invited up for the month or come up to visit with my father we, with my brother so I went to the ra- or to the train master and I said I'd like to have the month off of August <laughs> you just can't that's our business month I said mister I mean I've got to get it off he said, I said let me take a leave of absence he said that'd be just the same the same that we just can't do it well, not many people got hired on the railroad. Yeah, that was there. a hard job to get. Oh, yes. And I talked, I said, well, I'll just have to quit. He said, man, think about that. And I talked to my mother. She said, Roger, you're making more money than a college graduate. What in the world? And I said, well, I'll go see, I'll go up and see Mari and, 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 and then I'll, I'll, I'll go up to Alaska. They're making big money up there. I'll go up there and work construction. And on the way, I'll swing by Ontario. So, I quit my job at the railroad and I took off and went to Canada and I got there and she was out on the, on the pier and I was walking. I didn't know where to run or walk or something. So she waved and we walked a little bit and then we shook hands. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, nice to see you. Pleasure. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it wasn't long until uh, we, t- we took a walk and, uh, and I had a kiss and fell in love and, Three days later, we told her parents, we called my mother and said we was getting married. And she said, are you drunk, son? You've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so we told her parents. And even though she we couldn't go out anywhere, I mean, she couldn't date. She was, they, they were strict. Mm-hmm. They just said straight up that, listen, you don't know anything about his family, who he is. You go to Georgia and stay with his mother one month. And if you still want to marry him, I'll give you my blessings. And so we got in the car. <laughs> wow, this is pretty nice. So we stopped at a place and uh, I asked for a room and Mari says two rooms we're only engaged <laughs> oh <laughs> how old were you guys at this point you think 20 years old okay yeah that was 60 years ago wow and you found true love I found it and it's just been there ever since and, and nothing ever come between it and all of these years later I mean as soon as Max and I met you yesterday we could just sense it still and it's something special that you guys have and to be able to make it through the incredible life that you guys have lived and the separation that you guys had is truly amazing. It is. Say. And I, it, I, I just can't imagine any yeah. woman waiting that long, 33 years for a man in prison doing what I did. And just, you know, just, you wouldn't, wouldn't find one in a million. I don't reckon. No, I don't think so. And that's why your story was so special. We were so excited when we got the opportunity to talk to you. And and hear this because it's it truly is an amazing story, and I, I know our listeners are going to really enjoy this conversation. And as we mentioned before, many more stories in your book Smuggler, which folks can find um, on Amazon. We'll have all the links so that people can hear the entire amazing story of Roger and Mari Reeves and the worldwide adventures. <laughs> That, <laughs> that we've only touched on yeah. the the real story. I mean, I listened to the audiobook version. It's it's over twenty hours. Yeah, and it's read by Roger. I was yeah, and read and narrated by Roger himself. Yeah. And it's uh, never a dull moment. Yeah, 
as you might imagine. Yeah, absolutely. So, Roger, we want to thank you for joining us for this incredible interview. And and for anyone that's listening and is wondering, have, since you got out of prison, have you been back in an airplane? Yes, I I, I started flying again. I went right and <laughs> <laughs> down like you the little one said me too. So I uh yeah, I, I am enjoying it. He's back in the air. He's <laughs> back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This well what is, Roger, oh. one more question. Oh yeah. What's next for Roger and Murray Reeves? I'm thinking of buying an airplane and uh I would like, in the summertime, I want to go all the way to the top of Alaska and go back over the islands of uh, Diamond, <laughs> Diamond, Diamond A and Diamond B <laughs> and come on back and then maybe swing east and go down uh, through uh, Montreal, that, that area, French Quebec, and then come around and come back. And then in the wintertime, I want to go to the, to the tip of Chile, right down there and fly around Cape Horn and come back up Ushuaia and... Uh, come back up through the Andes and take more. I've, I've been through there quite a, quite a bit and take her to Machu Picchu and the places she's never been. You have so much energy left for someone who's almost 80. It's unbelievable. And what I admire about you the most is that you are living your life still and you're going to squeeze every last drop out of the opportunity. And now that professional pilots around the world know what your voice sounds like, They'll be listening for you on the radio. Yeah, if you're on <laughs> you're Santa flying. Barbara approach and yeah. you hear, uh, <laughs> oh, he's going to be flying all over the world still. So uh, if you hear them say uh, yeah. Cessna two four Quebec, uh, we show you a low altitude alert. Are you? <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you? We show you uh, right at sea level. Is that a, <laughs> intentional? Yeah, uh, man. Well, I'll have to tell the story of the tower out right here at Santa Barbara. Yeah, oh, yeah, you should. <laughs> yes, I had to get five hours to get re rated uh, to get. Current again, Current, yeah. Yes. So anyhow, a young fellow in there, and they had a little computer radio up there. I didn't pay it much attention. I said, you play that radio, and uh, I'll fly this airplane. Well, it, after an hour, I fly as good as I ever could. And uh, nice little thing, so we should fool around. I didn't pay much attention to that radio. So after I, I got my – I'm certified, I take Mari up for, for a ride. And I got everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I got the right, wrong transponder frequency. I, I'm on ground when I should have been on air. I mean, it's just, uh, he won't let me turn. I still want to turn around the university. Say, Keep your heading. So I'm going out over the ocean, going on out over the ocean. And finally, I said, Honolulu approach. What is your intention? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, w- when you get down to call FAA at this number. <laughs> so, all right. I, I came all around, landed, and uh, so uh, I went into the flight place, and they they kind of got me straightened out. And you know, he, said, he said it wasn't that bad. We listened. So uh, the guy was giving me a little bit of trouble. I'm telling you, what? So you know, he had me off on the long foot. <laughs> so I came home and called him, and he was giving me a little bit of lip. I said, "Listen, Mister, I hadn't flown in 40 years, and I didn't know how to work that radio. But uh, if you don't think I can fly, just Google Roger Reeves." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a week later, a week or two later, I took my grandson and great grandson for a flight, and I cranked it up and called Clarence Control, and he said, "Is that you, Roger?" You got down one file right and, and line up. We're going to take care of you. <laughs> so, and then when I came back, they had books and all for me to sign. At the oh, place that I, got place. I love it. I love yeah. that you're still in the air. That yeah. is awesome. I think that's a good place to wrap up. Again, your book is Smuggler. We encourage everyone to go read it. It is fascinating. Loved it. Thank you so much for your time, Roger. Thank you. The privilege has been mine. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Something else. Well, if you made it through both parts there, I think that was like five plus hours of tales from Roger. You and I heard even more than that. Hours of conversation we spent with him was probably closer to 10. (laughs) Um, so uh, I think, uh, whether or not you believe all his stories, I think we can all agree. He's definitely a gifted storyteller and we're excited to hear your feedback on this. We've already heard a lot of folks write in and, uh, many positive, many negative. So what did you think? Let us know. We'll be discussing it in a future episode. Yeah. And this show was certainly a change of gears. The intent of this podcast when we first started it was education and helping people stay engaged in what's going on in the business and things like that. This two-part series was purely for entertainment value. I don't know what everybody else's opinions are. We do know some that have reached out and we look forward to getting more, but I 
I've always been entertained by his stories. That's why I read his book and listened to all his podcasts. And I, I yep. thought it was interesting here to highlight the aviation points and dig a little deeper into that. Plus hear the rest of it again in person. So, you know, you know, a lot of uh, times you'll, you'll see people on Twitter or YouTube be like, this is not financial advice. You know, when they talk about money and stuff, this is not a career advice. That's the disclaimer I would give for this, <laughs> this show. I think if you uh, tried to fly yeah. a light airplane into you the couldn't. United States nowadays, yeah, you, there's, there's you, no way. We all know those, even do those 15,000 foot balloons. I mean, there's just yeah. no way, just no and, way. And as you heard, uh, prison isn't exactly a, a picnic either. So uh, I would steer clear of, of prison. Yeah. It's much easier to just be an airline pilot. <laughs> That's the big takeaway. It's almost you're right, with these new contracts that uh, airlines are signing. It's yeah. It's, just go into uh, one of the airline programs and uh, start go there and fly there for forty years. Exactly. All right. Well, we'll be back to more of our traditional content in the coming episodes in 2023. We are looking forward to, to continuing our journey with you. Onward we go. Thanks to our sponsors for their continued support of the show. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And until then, remember, flexibility is the key to our power. See you next time. See ya. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.